Welcome to Sikkim 365 Radio. From 31 yards, McPherson and Cincinnati is heading to the Super Bowl. Sikkim 365 Radio is presented by IdealMRI.com. High quality MRIs for $497 or less. IdealMRI.com. Your health is important, so is your budget. Third down and one. Stafford, end zone cut. Got it. Touchdown Rams. The 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. Garoppolo. Donald got there in the air, intercepted by the Rams, and they may ride to the Super Bowl on that. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Well, we have a Super Bowl, and man, would you like to have put some money on Cincinnati and Joe Burrow, Zach Taylor, and the Bengals, and of course the Rams, the other side of it, another incredible weekend in the NFL. As we head now for a week off and then Super Bowl 56 in L.A. at SoFi Stadium, the home team for the second consecutive year hosting a Super Bowl. Last year, the Buccaneers beat the Chiefs. And also, the SEC flexed some muscle over the weekend when it comes to college basketball. Let's not forget about that because Alabama nearly ran Baylor out of their arena. And then Kentucky embarrassed Kansas at Fog at Allen Fieldhouse, but Texas Tech Texas and also Iowa State with some wins that they needed, and TCU with a nice win as well. But the SEC obviously very strong over the weekend in college basketball. Baylor, West Virginia tonight is one of the games. And we are loaded up today to talk many things from college basketball to the NFL to a lot of things in between, including former Cowboys fullback and now the executive uh, vice president of the USFL and Daryl Johnston, Tim Brando, former A&M and Packers head coach Mike Sherman, so much to get to, and we will. Paul Catalina to my left, Craig Smoke, and in the studio today, Jack McKenzie, Emery, and Armstrong Sims. All right, what do you want to start with? The SEC and, and the Big 12 uh, college basketball? The new polls are out as well? Or, well, the Super Bowl is kind of a big deal. Yeah, I think we should probably start with the Super Bowl, and then we can work our way back into the, the uh, SEC Big 12 challenge, which, uh, f- for the first time in a little bit, didn't really lean the Big 12 so hard. Uh the best teams in the Big 12 lost, but uh, I am I am well. Ca- Texas Tech won. Yeah, uh, well the two the top two teams. Okay, I guess. Yeah. yeah, the top right. two teams uh, right. lost. Yeah. Uh, Baylor and Kansas, but I uh, I I am I am kind of fascinated that the Cincinnati Bengals are in the Super Bowl after all this time. And uh, my first thought, just tying it into what we do, is Jerry Jones is out of excuses completely. Because if Mike Brown can get there, and I'm going to say this again later in the show, if Mike Brown can get there. And he is abjectly not nearly as good as J- uh, Jerry Jones as an owner when it comes to everything else in the world, when it comes to being an NFL owner. Jerry beats him at everything. But turned around in the field, no excuse. There's no excuse because Mike Brown, widely known as a guy who doesn't nearly care enough about the league as, as maybe Jerry does or all those things. And I thought like, well, anybody can do it if the Bengals can do it because they've been – 
uh, either average or terrible for 30 years. More than that. And they're in it because they made some good decisions. It's been a long time since the days of what was it? Ken, Ken uh, Johnson? Who's the quarterback that they had? Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson, among many others, it's been a long time. Craig, your thoughts? The Bengals. Now, next up, when it comes to the longest drought, the Lions, Washington, Dallas. Yep, they're on the clock as far as longest droughts to play in the Super Bowl. Uh, Bengals have a better quarterback than Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, Bengals have, a, you know, just a, a magic about them right now. Um, you know, forget history. Uh, you know, history, people can sit there and wallow in that and be like, well, we've just never been good and we're just never going to be good or we're just never going to be good again. I mean, look, the Bengals haven't been really all that relevant outside of a couple pops here and there, you know, the playoff teams and things like that, but never really a threat to win anything of, substan of, of substance. And, uh, shoot, I mean, it's been – you know, since the 80s, uh, since they were, it's the Boomer Esiason days, yeah. since they were in, in this game, and, and here they are. And, and, you know, this the the Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, LSU magic that they had to, to do what they did at LSU and then to turn that around and to do it in the NFL and with a franchise that's just been really irrelevant for quite some time now it's it's incredible i mean it really is the, the joe burrow story is unbelievable and i think you have to put the jamar chase story in there as well even though burrow being the quarterback he's going to get all the attention but jamar chase has been by his side the entire time right um and for them to have the run they've had over the last you know three four years uh and to have the opportunity to where they very well could win a super bowl i'm not banking on it i think i'm picking rams right now but uh to even be in this spot i think is just one of the better stories yeah, that we've seen in sports uh, in this very short year, but even you know going back to last year as well, it's been uh, fun to watch, and uh, I'm I'm glad they're in the game. You know, the Chiefs would have been fun, uh, but we've gotten our taste of them, and you know everybody was completely ready to write off the Bengals early in that game yesterday. I mean, I saw so many. This game's over. Is you know not even halftime. This game's over, and then you know since he's just that team, you got to make sure they're dead. And if they're not, then they got enough playmakers to make something happen. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. Uh, hats off to them. Uh, had to be a thrilling time in the city. Uh, I would imagine yesterday, and, and probably will be for the you know all the way in the build up to the Super Bowl, but incredible performance by Cincinnati and you know same thing for the Rams and uh you know I, I like the game that we got it's going to be very interesting very different from what we've been used to there's always a Brady tie-in mm -hmm. or a Mahomes or Roethlisberger it's always the same guys and now we get something completely brand new and fresh with Stafford and, and Burrow as the quarterback battle and just the teams in general so I, I'm, I like it I think it's awesome I don't have the stat in front of me but it may have been even a few days ago but the the, the Super Bowls like over the last well since Tom Brady's first one in Roethlisberger, there have been so few, maybe like three or four, and maybe none, where it wasn't Brady, Roethlisberger, and there was somebody else. And it wouldn't have been Rodgers because it's well, – Russell Wilson's been in a couple. Yeah, no, it was somebody uh – -huh. it was another name, and all of them now uh, are on their way out. But uh, – uh, and, and Brady, of course, the announcement over the weekend, although not yet official, and it may tie into a February 4th $15 million bonus, but it looks like that era is over. And, of course, we don't know yet the future of what Aaron Rodgers might do. Mike Sherman – he was there when the Packers went to a Super Bowl under Mike Holmgren. He was also there during the transition of Brett Favre to Aaron Rodgers. He also, of course, was at A&M for quite some time. Miami, the CFL, just name it. His son-in-law is Zach Taylor of the Cincinnati Bengals, former Nebraska quarterback. And he joins us today at 3.30 to discuss the, uh, the, the fast-rising career. And Cincinnati, you say that they've done very few right for many, many years. Maybe they've gotten a little bit better. They could have if a lot of other teams, they would have gotten impatient with Zach Taylor after two years. They stayed with him. Burrow was hurt last year. It's paid off that sometimes maybe patience is not bad. We'll hear Daryl Johnson, former Cowboys fullback, the Moose, who's now helping run the USFL today at 435 on the new league and also his experiences of what he's seen with championship weekend. Tim Brando at four. And uh, Baylor women's guard. Jordan Lewis, named the Big 12 Offensive Player of uh, Player of the Week, excuse me, will join us today at 4:45. We'll have Ross Tucker. We are loaded up with so much. The chat room is also going ballistic off the start as well. Now we have that game, so that one's set. Bengals and Rams, and it's kind of a refreshing. You know, Chiefs were trying to get to their what fourth and straight, third straight Super Bowl, mm -hmm. winning, losing, and then trying to get back. Not there. 
And, and it's kind of nice sometimes, unless you're a Chiefs fan, to have a change uh, of the guard or the 49ers as well. I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy for Matt Stafford overall. I mean, just because there was a guy who toiled with the Lions and, you know, people kind of doubted him a little bit. He played in three playoff games. In fact, I believe he was the uh, Tony Romo's uh, playoff win was was Matt Stafford, or one of his two playoff wins was, was Matt Stafford. And uh, I... I, I mean, he came into the Rams and look, he, he wasn't, he's not fantastic. He's not Joe Burrow good, I think, uh, when it comes to it. But he's, he's got some skins on the wall when it comes to, you know, dealing with things in the league and not playing in meaningful games. And finally, he gets his wish to play in the most meaningful game. And uh, really, you know, other, he had made a couple bad throws yesterday, but uh, his. You know, addition to the roster to turn Cooper Cup from a really good wide receiver into an MVP candidate. So yeah. I, I'm I'm just really happy. For Does Stafford. Matt Stafford immediately because of what he did this year after what were statistically like the first one to 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 yards, the one year where you're on a team that wins and you go to a Super Bowl, you still have to win it. Does his MV, uh, does his Hall of Fame resume change even for the better because of just one year? Or was he also going to be one of those, he compiled a lot of stats guys? I don't know. He If he wins the Super Bowl, then he kind of maybe moves into that Kurt Warner category where you, you just can't say no anymore because he's he did a lot of good things. You know, Warner was was on good teams all the time, though, for the most part. But he was just, I mean, Stafford never was. And yeah. it was just constantly overshadowed because of the Lions being so bad. All right, Auburn, number one in the country. Gonzaga, UCLA, numbers two and three. Kentucky, smack. I mean, beat the hell out of Kansas at Allen Fieldhouse. It's going to be an interesting week in the Big 12. Tomorrow night, in fact, Armstrong, tomorrow night, here is the latest video, and this is from one of the media outlets in Lubbock, Texas. Tomorrow night, Texas Tech will host Texas in uh, uh, what is, this is camping out, students camping out, and this line has grown just enormous getting ready to try to get tickets for that game tomorrow night chris beard in texas and they had a nice win against tennessee they had to hold on they were drowning at the end couldn't score for six or seven minutes and a free throw helped them beat tennessee and they had a shot tennessee did to win it but missed it 52 <clears throat> 51 that's tomorrow night tonight baylor host west virginia tcu plays at oklahoma but what an impressive win for kentucky and alabama bipolar I talked to Pat Nunley. I saw him yesterday morning. He said to me, those three guards remind me. You hear about how they couldn't guard Baylor's guards last year? Alabama's guards. He compared them not quite to Jared Butler, Maceo Teague, and Davion Mitchell, but he said, David, that team can win it all. The problem is, can they stay focused week in or week out or game in and game uh, out to do it? Of their... Of the of Baylor's three losses, I didn't feel that I felt they played the best in this one because there were times where they're offensively doing some good things. What they did not do in this game was they'd make a good play and then they wouldn't follow it up. Matthew Meyer goes and makes an outstanding block, but it goes right into the hands of Alabama's point guard who nails a three. Yep. So the block and he got himself in that kind of that early kind of annoying foul trouble where but, he had to sit out for a while but too. see but when that happens then you you made a good block and you stopped the two pointer that then turns into a three so you should have just let the guy make the two the five point six point swing yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i agree texas tech is 14 uh, they blew out mississippi state again home against texas you have texas and texas tech tomorrow baylor's got to take care of their business tonight and then coming up this weekend you have Kansas and Baylor in Allen Fieldhouse in Lawrence. And those two teams coming off getting uh, popped a little bit on Saturday as well. So a lot going on. Kansas, by the way, tomorrow night plays at Iowa State. I mentioned the games uh, tonight. Ticket prices for that game in Lubbock from anywhere from $235 a ticket to $1,850. <laughs> it's nuts. Now, uh, I've seen some chatter from UT fans because Texas Tech is, you know, they're obviously not happy with Chris Beard leaving, going to a rival or whatever, and UT's on a three-game winning streak back inside the top 25 where I've actually seen some UT fans saying, well, I guess we're playing for the national championship tomorrow for in Lubbock. It seems like it's that way for Texas Tech. Oh, no question. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, it's a huge deal emotionally. And Carlos Silva, who's become our guy in Lubbock, will join us tomorrow on the show early to talk about the environment in Lubbock, Texas. You mean Tech fans are upset that their coach that they bought into and believed in, to their own foolishness, because anybody who does that in college sports, you're just a fool if you believe anybody's sticking around for forever. But, 
You mean Tech fans were kind of upset about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, imagine, imagine. Can't you know? Texas fans will never be able to relate because it'll never happen to them. But uh, yeah, Tech fans are pissed at Chris Beard, and yeah, this is like a year in the making at this point. I mean, they've had this game circled since he left, and so it's no surprise that yeah, they're very much into it. I think any sort of like trying to to make fun of them for that is is just I don't know. I think that. Uh, they have every right to feel that way. Like, if they didn't, I, I think that would be sort of surprising if they weren't fired up for Chris Beard's return to Lubbock. I mean, they've been talking about this game, like I said, for since the moment he left, really. Yeah. So this was to be expected, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure it'll be a, a raucous house. And, you know, if you're Tech, you got to win this game. I mean, there's nothing worse than you getting all fired up and spending three nights in a row because, like, they had people camping out on, like, Friday night yep. for these tickets. And, uh, you know, to sit there and spend that amount of time – uh, you better sure hope that uh, you know they're able to. Mark Adams is able to get the job done because the last thing that they would want to see is is Chris Beard walk in there and get Texas well, another win. What they have to do is not hyperventilate, not get too overly hyped for the game. Just go play your game. Texas Tech and Texas tomorrow night. You were about I, to add something else. I, I'll say this: Craig Craig made a good point about not fa falling in love with your coach and thinking they stay there forever. College fans who fall in love with a coach are kind of like Liz Taylor husbands back in the '60s, <laughs> where yeah. like on your I'll wedding day, one. like yeah, this is. This is the one that's going to make it forever. Like, no, dude, you're number four. Yeah. Like, believe me, there's going to be a five, six, nine. seven, eight. Yeah. yeah, you're four of nine. Uh, now, one other note. Uh, by the way, Remy Martin it continues to kind of struggle for Kansas. Baylor does play them Saturday at Allen Fieldhouse before. They, of course, focus tonight on their game with West Virginia, who's been kind of reeling with Bob Huggins and that team. Bill Self, today, according to Matt Tate, who we had on last week, he's playing with basically a leg and a half. Can't move. Adds that he's trying and going as hard as he can, but he just can't. Just tough right now. Self saying that he's taking a third uh, or a quarter of the reps in practice, probably at around 60 to 70 percent. James Akinjo, who kind of gave it a go, had some tough moments in that Baylor loss to Alabama. Uh, he, of course, is not quite 100 percent. So the two teams who have highest ranked teams and still are, even despite the losses, are trying to battle through some of that part of the attrition of what's going on with uh, both of those teams. But, man, I tell you what, the SEC, though, that Kentucky win. Alabama beating Baylor after they have wins against Gonzaga and Houston, Houston. and others. Now they've won three of the four games in the Final Four. They've beaten them. But uh, that Kentucky game was an was a, um, a curb stomping almost from day one. And it got no, lower, not, no, no closer to like 14 or 16 points, and Kentucky surges up. Uh, to number five in the poll. And Auburn looked very impressive in handling what they did against Oklahoma. Yeah, I was very impressed by, you know, the SEC winning the challenge the way that they did. I think that's, a, what, a couple in a row they've now yep. won. Uh, they won, uh, I guess it was the last go-round as well. So, yeah, uh, that was shocking to see Kansas get beat up the way that they did. I mean, I was really surprised. As good as Alabama is, and they're better than even I expected after watching them, but I was still surprised Baylor lost that game. Like, I, I had no thoughts going into that game that Baylor would, would be on the losing end, and yet they were. So uh, big props to, to Alabama. They've clearly got a very talented team who's just been through some things, uh, but, you know, definitely got back on the right track on Saturday and had a nice home crowd and, you know, uh, glad that some of the Big 12 teams were able to handle their business. But, yeah, there's, there's no doubt after that weekend uh, that, you know, the SEC's got bragging rights, uh, and, and they were able to knock off the top, top teams uh, outside of, you know, tech or whatever. But uh, for the most part, you go and beat Kansas and Baylor, uh, that alone is going to probably win you, win you a challenge, and uh, it did. All right, so uh, from Jace Pierce, what would the reaction be if Tech ends up losing? Very curious. Hope it doesn't happen, but it would be funny to do all of this for a loss. Well, I mean, there are teams – I remember when game day comes in, schools will have the camp out. Of course, there's certain games, but now this one's got extra special meaning, no question about it. And I understand why the emotions of it. And now what Texas Tech, as I mentioned, they just got to go play their game. They're really good. But UT's now won three in a row. But that game with Tennessee on Saturday, I just turned it off. They were up I, a lot. They were up a ton. And next thing you know, I get an alert at the top of my phone that they weather the storm and Tennessee has an open three to win the game. They didn't score Texas uh, from the field like in seven minutes. They just went 52-51 Rick Barnes in return. Talk about emotions. That was more of a homecoming for him. Texas set it up as welcoming him back after he had left to go leave for the Vols. That, that, to me, though, like, welcome back, Rick Barnes, considering how much they threw garbage on him on his way out the door was was kind of empty. Well, no, I, I think he liked it. 
I think he appreciated it, so that's all really that yeah. matters. But, yeah, that was kind of like, you know, we kind of blanked down his neck, and it's part of the coaching changes. And so he's coming back, and it's not going to happen often. And I, it, let's, let's, let's tell him at least we appreciated well, what he the, did when he was here, even though we wanted him to run well, out the door. The, the, the next coach came in and didn't do anything. So it's kind of, it's kind of how I think uh, – to compare it to the rival, I was at the Alamo Bowl after Dennis Francione got fired, and I and I saw Coach Slocum like walking around, and of course, Coach Francione was the one who they replaced Coach Slocum with, and all of a sudden, all these A and M fans that wanted Slocum out the door were treating him like he oh, was yeah. King Tut, and they should, and, anyway. and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but and then. Because they knew, you know, and it's kind of like that. Like, oh, well, Shaka Smart didn't do anything at Texas. Maybe we should have been a little bit nicer to Rick. Well, what it would mean is uh, just a really bad, embarrassing loss. I mean, just because, you you know, all the hype for it and the fact that you're at home and uh, you want revenge or whatever you want to call that, uh, that would be the, you know, the personal part of it. it would just be a bad feeling amongst the Tech fan base that, you know, you got all fired up and Chris Beard came in and beat you. Uh, that wouldn't be a, a fun pill to swallow. But what it also mean would be Tech would be hovering above 500 in Big 12 play. You know, for as good as they are, for as highly as they're ranked, for as much as we talk about them, they're 5-3 and three in the Big 12. If they're losing to Texas, they'd be 5-4, and four, and I don't care how tough the league is, that's still not a pretty mark to be at 500. No, uh, because or, uh, you can blink, as you said. You lose a game, you can have a three-game losing streak. Yeah, every, one so, of those day, every single team has that, that threat. So what you're avoiding is trying to be hovering at 500. I mean, you win tomorrow, or was it uh, – Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, yeah. T uh, Baylor night cap. Uh, you win tomorrow night, and you're you know six and three. You lose, you're five and four, and so that to me is is a big deal about winning that game tomorrow night. Is just keeping your head above water in the Big Twelve and separating yourself a little bit from Texas as well. And for Texas, I mean, they're right there in the same spot. So if they get a win, they're six and three. Got a win in Lubbock after a win with Tennessee. And I mean, they'd be rolling. Uh, quite frankly, they lose, they're still fine, but they would be back closer towards 500 so they're both kind of in the the exact same spot right now and so somebody's going to be above the other uh, tomorrow night that's what i think that means texas tech can say this if they can beat texas at home and they're favored probably to do that uh, they then their schedule opens up a little bit but they do have road games against right now we don't know who west virginia is it's not a good series situation for them and they play baylor tonight at oklahoma that's a uh, an interesting game but they've already played kansas twice they've already played at baylor well meanwhile ut who has won three in a row and put themselves right there at the near the top of the conference they still have to play both kansas and baylor both home and away uh, and and so of course and also as we mentioned their game tomorrow night at uh, texas tech as well armstrong there's a graphic of the super bowl we showed you i mentioned the tickets for texas and texas tech 280 dollars to uh, 2800 or whatever you may not be able to see this very well uh this is a graphic that was put up about right now two weeks before the game of ticket prices at SoFi Stadium for the game between the Rams and the Bengals. Now, Cincinnati's not a huge city. It's a big city, but it's not like New York or Chicago, whatever. But I'm so thrilled for them. I really am for the franchise. But look at the ticket prices. The cheapest we saw, Paul, in that top right-hand corner uh, was around 40-something or 50-something hundred dollars. It was, it was la less than 5000 up in the up yeah. in the top right corner. So... Uh, <coughs> jump on those right now. And and then some, if you look at the numbers, are in the $30,000 range. For right? a ticket. Yes, a single ticket. For one ticket. And that's today. Now, usually what happens is those tickets are right where they are, and then they climb as everyone's interest, and now everyone knows who's going to go in, the, who could afford the trip, the airlines, the hotels. This is a, And then it sometimes can level off a little bit before game time and then depending on how much cincinnati fans want to buy into it you're going to get the hollywood set that's nothing for them that's like a hundred dollar bill some of that money uh it, it will be interesting plus the nfl of course has all of what they put into it as well with the uh, the stars the glitz the glamour of la yeah if you were a rams or browns fan it's like if they ever make the super bowl i'm gonna make sure i go i uh -huh. hope you are saving up your money for a while because yeah super bowl tickets are not uh are not for your average fan by any means they are very much uh you know better have big bucks to even start the conversation and you know quite frankly that leads to kind of those weird super bowl crowds you get where some of it's for both teams and then a lot of it's just 
miscellaneous fans who are there just for the show who really have no fighting interest whatsoever. They just they want to be there for the Super Bowl or for the halftime show or whatever just to say that they were there. You get a lot of that, and I'm sure you'll get a ton of that in L.A. But, yeah, I saw DiCaprio chatting up David Duchovny in the yeah, box last yeah. night and, um, you know, a few more stars there. Uh, so I'm sure it'll be, you know, star-studded in Los Angeles, and they'll really play that up, and we'll get plenty of, you know, cameo shots throughout the game, I'm sure, of – know this tv actor and this movie star and whatever but uh, what else would you expect with la and la in the super bowl in la yeah. the, nobody ever makes the home super bowl now we've had it two years in yeah. a row Crazy. uh with the with the bucks and the rams but uh i do <laughs> that's one thing that's weird is so and the higher you get the more fans there are like actual real fans they are yeah um, in minnesota a few years ago i was at the, you know i i, I use our game credit for, for that game uh when the eagles beat the patriots and to my left was the entire city of Philly is so much so that it smelled like hoagies over here. And then to my right was clam chowder. Yes. I mean, so it was funny but because we're up. Oh, those are, yeah, those are. ones down there, those are corporate seats. Those yeah. are sponsors and, and but, teams but and if all you, that. If you took the, the elevator down to the lower level and walked around, uh, you're talking about like this is like, oh, look, there's Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Like that's. Yeah, from DG, uh, I have a really good friend, a buddy from my college days who's like family to me. And in my family from Ohio, he is ecstatic. The Bungles are now uh, the Bengals, he said, because of just that alone. From the 360, $4,830. In section 535, I'll take 10 seats. I want them painted orange and black, <laughs> 10 gyros. And some ram juice as well. That's from the 360. Thank you for that text as well. Matt, earlier today, overreaction Monday, Coach Drew in Alabama driving inside. To beat Auburn in March, Baylor has to improve. So does everybody else, it seems. And Jerry, please hire a young coach and do what the Rams did as well. He means a young coach, Zach Taylor. But I think what he means to do what the Rams did is go back to who you used to be and go all in. Vaughn Miller, Odell Beckham. Uh, Jalen Ramsey. Uh, Jalen Ramsey. <laughs> Matthew uh, Stafford. Matthew Stafford. The Rams said, screw it. We're going to go all in. They got close, what, two or three years ago. We're going to go all in. It could. They don't have any first-round picks until, like, perhaps, I don't know, eternity. But if they win the Super Bowl, it's worth doing what they're doing, even if it bankrupt, bank, bankrupts you from having a chance to draft people early in the in the NFL draft. But for the Cowboys, they've been built like they, they stopped doing that, which they were doing too much of because they were trying to sustain an era, right? Right. So they stopped doing it and they started building for the future, a future that has never come. It's not been there. So look, if you if you really believe in Dak to the, the amount that you do believe in him, and he's uh, you know, he's on that second tier of NFL quarterbacks towards the top of the second tier, but he's good enough to he's good enough to get you to a Super Bowl and win you a Super Bowl. He is plenty good enough to do that. Uh, if if that's the case, then start mortgaging the future, Jerry, because it's been too long. Just do it. Because planning for the future, you know, like they've got one hell of an IRA apparently, but they're no close to dying. But then the so Bengals, retiring. did the Bengals go all in? No, they drafted Burrow. He ends up being incredible. He's a freaking, uh, 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 golly, he's I unbelievable. Would I would compare Jamar them. Chase? I would compare them more to the Rams, though, at this point than the Bengals just based on the way that the franchises have ridden and, and fallen throughout I, the I don't years. know if there is a safe way. I yeah. don't know if there's the right way. I think no. everyone, you just take your shot, and sometimes it works out when you overspend or you give up draft picks, and, and sometimes they, it does not. They did it two completely different ways. Yep. I mean, so there's not one way to skin a cat here. Look at the teams in this game. They both did it different ways. The Bengals have just floundered for years. Mentioned Marvin Lewis's 0 for playoff record. Hey, let's get there every year and just lose the first time we play over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And, you know, then just kind of a transition period, nothing really notable. Eventually, you know, Zach Taylor gets a little something going. Eventually he gets Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow, and that's really what flipped everything for the Rams. I mean, they've been just going out. They didn't draft – most of their star players, they went and signed them. Matthew Stafford, Jalen Ramsey. We talked about all these stars they went and picked up. They did it the splashy, let's, you know, tie up our franchise and incredible contracts and, you know, just go all in. Uh, the Bengals are not, like, all in or bust in this game. The Rams are. Mm -hmm. The Rams aren't going to have many opportunities with this type of team to keep doing this version of what they're doing. The Bengals have, like, the next decade 
to do well, whatever until, they want until to. they have to pay burrow and yeah, yeah but, and that's that's in three to four years yeah, yeah they have no nothing to worry about right now uh so they're two completely side two different sides of the aisle and i think i'm actually rooting for the Bengals because it's just so improbable that they're here and the fact that they are kind of like the poor kid versus the rich kid in this game because look at the rosters i mean just simply look at the rosters and how they were put together uh but you know I, i'm I don't really have much of a dog in the uh, fight, but I do think it's interesting that, you know, for all the, well, you should do it this way. Go buy, 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 yeah. buy. Okay, they got the Rams here finally, you know, after they finally got Stafford on top of all the other chips they stacked up. Or you can do it where you just draft well, get the right quarterback, get the right receiver, and just a good enough offensive line and defense, quite frankly. And here are the Bengals. So, I mean, you know, there's not one way to do it. it, it there's uh, not. There's, but, you know. Well, it's, and, and Rich, Rich Boone on the chat, the Rams did it the L.A. way, buying yes. a team versus building a team. Exactly. It yeah. works for some, and sometimes it just sets you back a decade. And if you look at owner, like Stan Kroenke is a guy who all the owners are mad at now because he's getting them all sued. But uh, he's a guy who's, you know, money whips everything and – you know, built the like he owns the stadium in LA. He, the city yep. of Los Angeles didn't have to pay for it. Nope. He paid for it and it was nothing to him. Uh, Mike Brown is a guy who every time the collective bargaining agreement comes up, the big owners in the league have to sit down with Mike Brown and go, Mike, stop. They are the Minnesota <laughs> Twins. Yeah, exactly. Is that That's right? Yeah. Is that fair to the yeah. Tampa Bay Rays? Yeah. Yeah. In, I mean, but the Rays have had success, really good success. Uh, where the Twins have had World Series success even during the years in I, which they wouldn't pay I, I know that, too and look, much. And did you see Mike Brown on TV at all no. yesterday? You know why he doesn't care? He's not. It's not his thing. Uh, he doesn't recognize like players in the that he pays. Like he he meets with them a couple times. He turns them completely over to the general manager and, and moves on. How about that? Yeah, as look, an idea. Uh, yeah, Quan Cosby told me a story one time. He was in the lunch line and Mike Brown came out and was talking to a guy thinking he was Carson Palmer and it wasn't. Yeah, you know, just kind of how Mike Brown is. From Blake well, Robinson, uh, and, oh, go ahead, Craig. I was going to say uh, it's also a big day if you're an um, Oklahoma fan. I mean, seeing P. Ryan and Mixon out there doing yeah. their thing for the Bengals. P. Ryan obviously had a, a big play. And uh, Mixon you know, ran LSU, so hard yeah, in that overtime, man. LSU fans obviously enjoying the you know the Jamar Chase and Joe Burrow. And how about just fans in the Regulate. city of Cincinnati? I mean, going from the Bearcats to uh, now what the Bengals are doing. I mean, this has been the greatest football year in that city's history especially if they can pull off the, the Super Bowl win. I know Cincinnati, you know, college football didn't end the way that they wanted it to. But, I mean, to get to the playoff was a feat Special. in its own right. So, yeah, I mean, what an incredible job by Luke Vickle and Zach Taylor and a couple pretty good quarterbacks as well. And, yeah, it's an amazing ride for that city right now. I think uh, the Reds – Paul, are they supposed to be any good if there was a season? Uh, they're they're going to be pissed if there's kinda, no season because it's they're their kind year. Of on yeah. the, they're kind of on the eh. – yeah. All right, no. uh, from uh, Blake Robinson. New hotel opening up in Vegas, Arch District on 222-22. A Marriott Bonvoy tribute, tribute, property named the English Hotel, with food by Todd English, rooms sold already at least $3,000 a night, which in Vegas, I guess that's – that may not be bad, considering it's a brand new hotel. I don't know. A lot of times, so where they going to put us up for the Super Bowl next year? I, they were thinking about it. From uh, Stephen Bengals' offensive line was night and day between the Raiders and the Chiefs game. Yeah, because mm -hmm. Burrow has been running for his life. He's been sacked more times than I think any quarterback ever who's made it to a Super Bowl, and they kept him upright for the most. Jack Steele on the chat room. Daryl Johnson will join us in an hour. Uh, he is now the USFL's executive vice president for uh, pro football operations. Former Cowboys fullback joins us today at, uh, at, at in exactly an hour. But when we come back, and there's so much to get to, when we come back, he was the head coach of the Packers during the Favre to Rodgers transition, was the assistant coach under Mike Holmgren when the Packers won a Super Bowl, A&M, Dolphins. He's been a lot of places lately, the Canadian Football League. He is the father-in-law of Bengals head coach Zach Taylor the former Nebraska quarterback, and Mike Sherman joins us next on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Super Bowl is in two weeks, everybody, and BetUS.com has all kind of great bets going on with it, great action on the Super Bowl, and for 50 bucks, you can get involved, prop bets, whatever you want to do, daily lines, all that is the Super Bowl 
at BetUS.com and use our promo code SIGGUM125 for 125% bonus on cash or SIGGUM200 for a 200% bonus if you use crypto. So if you are looking to bet the Super Bowl, looking for a you know a nice little discount when you're on the way in, 50 bucks, 125% on cash, 200% on crypto using our promo codes SIGGUM125 and SIGGUM200. That's SIGGUM125 and SIGGUM200 at BetUS.com. Kick off your new year with the Start Something New sales event. The 2021 Chrysler 300 has total values of 4000 or 0% for 72 months and $2,000 in bonus cash. And the new 2021 Dodge Charger gets 0% for 72 months. For all first responders, get an extra $500. Shop for power, performance, style, and reliability today from Allen Samuels and Waco with the Start Something New sales event. Come by. Let's be friends. See dealer for details. All offers have credit requirements. One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Ben Erlinson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Ben Erlinson, 100 North 6th Street in Waco, 254 759 8533. Edward Jones, member SI. PC. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Nitchie Group Insurance Agency. With the Nitchie Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Nitchie Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Nitchie Group at 1-800-258-8302. You know what would make this moment better? Pizza. Dough made from scratch and an Italian family sauce recipe, pizza. Three fresh signature cheeses making a melty blanket of perfection pizza. Like loads of premium toppings like crispy old world pepperoni, savory Italian sausage, and fresh sliced veggies pizza. That's Marco's Pizza. Visit Marco's.com and make any moment better. And with four locations in Waco, Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and soon to open in Robinson. Marco's. Pizza lovers get it. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Call us on the Bet US Hotline 254 339 1122. Welcome. 
We are now joined by former NFL and college football coach Mike Sherman, who uh, knows a little bit about Zach Taylor, the Bengals head coach who's headed to the Super Bowl, because that, of course, early in his career was where Zach Taylor started to understand the coaching business. And Mike, thanks for your time. How proud. And oh, by the way, that's your son-in-law as well of Zach Taylor and what he's done with Cincinnati. Yeah, no, I'm really proud of the fact how he overcame uh, the last two years. Uh, they were tumultuous years. I mean, only won one game the first year and I think five last year. And so certainly he was on a hot seat. To, to he, but the thing about Zach, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't feel the hot seat quite that much. He, he knows what he's doing. He believes in what he's doing. And uh, uh, you know, he really felt like uh, this was going to be a great season for him and the team. Uh uh, because of the acquisitions they made in the offseason, plus the development of quarterback Joe Burrows. Uh, Mike, Zach Taylor, uh, when he was a player at Nebraska, had a lot of moxie. He was a gamer, much like Joe Burrow does. Is that why they work so good together? Because at least their playing mentalities were similar? Well, uh, to give Joe Burrows a little more credit, he's a He's a little bit better, at, a little bit better uh, quarterback than uh, Zach was. Because Zach obviously wasn't drafted; he wasn't the first round pick. But uh, they probably do share a lot of the similarities. I think they're both very cerebral and, and thinkers, and, and are creative uh, in their approach to the game, and uh, and have and they both have uh, an amazing amount of confidence, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, they they believe in what they're doing, and. Uh, uh, having winning mentality uh, just about every single time they take the field. How did uh, that work out with Zach coaching with you on your staff at Texas A&M? Is that just something you knew of him? He, you kind of heard about him or was it even before that? Well, I mean, he and my daughter uh, went to Marquette, you know, undergraduate in journalism, then went to the University of Nebraska where Tim Cassidy, who was at A&M with me, uh, he was in Nebraska, and Sarah went into their communications department and working with uh, the SID and so forth. And uh, Zach happened to be the starting quarterback, and lo and behold, in, in two years, uh, uh, they end up getting married. And uh, so when when he graduated, uh, he came down. To, I was at Houston at the time on my way to go up to Texas A&M, and, uh, and we talked about different things. And I said, hey, listen, uh, you definitely can be – on my staff, but you'll be a graduate assistant and you won't be on the field the first year. You're going to be in the office only. And uh, he was taken, as was my daughter, taken back by that just a little bit. That felt like uh, his career warranted him to be on the field. But, I, you know, I didn't want to look like we were just, you know, having favorites. Plus, I had promised position to somebody else on the field. So uh, he handled that well. And then the, the next three years, uh, he basically was a graduate assistant coaching the tight ends. And so um, when I had a chance to go to Miami after that as the offense coordinator, um, I was able to bring him along with me. Uh, he knew all our signals. He knew everything about the playbook. And so uh, he was definitely a, uh, a positive uh, in relationship to a transition that we were making there with Ryan Tannehill. What about him showing that he was a head coach? I mean, because he's still, I mean, this is a pretty meteoric rise for him to be assistant and head coach now in the Super Bowl in just a couple of years. Uh, well, I, I, I tell you, I think that his confidence, uh, he just, he believes in himself and what he's doing. And uh, uh, when you're talking to him, you feel like you're talking to a head coach, uh, by the way he carries himself and uh, uh, and how he interacts with players. But I, I think he has a great uh, demeanor to be a head coach in the sense that uh, he's not real. It doesn't get real, real high. Doesn't get real, real low. Uh, does not let things affect him. Uh, he's going to do what he thinks is right. Um, he's also going to develop relationships on the team. Uh, that will cement that team together, which is what he really did this year with this group of people he has working for him. He was able to transition out of last year. We had some guys, some naysayers, so to speak, uh, that that go in the dark parts of the locker room and, and talk about stuff that's not uh, you know, favorable for our team atmosphere. And uh, he was able to transition away from that into something much better with the players that they were able to pick up and uh, uh, and bring on the team. How much do you think that uh, his experience with the Rams and obviously under you, among others, that he has been that kind of put him in position to have uh, really where he is today as well? 
Well, I think any experience that he's had, because he hasn't had a ton, uh, obviously, as you've already mentioned, but uh, all of his experiences in some way, shape, or form uh, played out. Uh, just like this week, uh, you know, watching the game, uh, he, he was using some max protection uh, uh, things uh, to, to help borrowers get a little bit more time after having given up the, the nine sacks last week. He came into this one and wanted to protect the quarterback a little bit more. And uh, and so maybe he got, took a little bit of that from uh, from what we were doing in Miami and at A&M. And then uh, uh, obviously uh, he took uh, – a huge chunk of the playbook with all the motion by the receivers uh, took a huge chunk of the playbook from the Rams and, and brought that into become part of what he is now. You've been around the game a long time, coach. Uh, have you ever seen anyone like Jamar Chase have the kind of effect he had so early on? No, it's funny you say that. No, I haven't to be honest with you. And uh, uh, the game has changed. I mean, you, you can't come out of the, these playoffs uh, and even this season and not say the game is in a better place today than, it, than it's ever been. I mean, uh, it's much more exciting, I think, to throw the ball down the field. I mean, if you can't defend a back shoulder throw, you're going to give up a bunch of yardage, and that's, those aren't easy to defend. You can defend them from going deep, and then you can defend them from turning around and taking a back shoulder throw. So, um uh, it's been quite an exciting year, and I think uh, a lot of creativity by coaches. But I, but I'll be honest with you, a lot of this stuff comes from high school. It, it, it stems from high school to college and college to, to the pros. We see a, a great quality at the quarterback position across the board, and that's because these high school coaches are elevated their game to a level where these guys are being taught at a very, very uh, deep level of quarterback play. And then they go up to the college, and the colleges build off of that, and then then on to the pros. But I I don't think the game has ever had this many really good young quarterbacks, you know, kind of taking the places of Peyton Manning and Brett Favre and and Brady now possibly and and so forth and so on. Um, It's exciting. Yeah, and, and you've been around a few uh, great names and quarterbacks in, in your life as well. And, and in fact, Brett Favre, and then on the transition with Aaron Rodgers. And, and, it, and it's, there always seems to be somebody, right? That It's just a matter. It's a great league. There's great college programs. Somebody's going to step up, maybe not be Hall of Famer material, but it's just a matter of the transition of uh, from one generation to the next. Well, when uh, when Brett was um, with us at, at the Packers, obviously we drafted Aaron, and uh, uh, Aaron actually sat on the bench for three years, and we didn't think anything about it uh, at that time. Uh, we just figured it would be a natural maturation period for him, and just like everybody else has gone through, you know, most people would say uh, you can't play a rookie as a quarterback. But what's happening now, is, which has totally changed is that uh, particularly for these young guys, you know, the Mahomes and the, the Burroughs uh, and the whatnots, uh, is, the, is the fact that uh, people are changing their offenses to fit the quarterback instead of trying to make the quarterback fit the offense. A great example would be Baltimore. I mean, they, they definitely they wholesale change to make the quarterback uh, friendly to the offense um, that, that they were going to have. And so uh, they made that, that offense fit him instead of making him fit the offense and and that really is the way it should be anyways particularly if you're going to play a young quarterback he has to have some knowledge of something previous to previous to seven on that field the first day of practice where he can associate uh uh that he can associate with and have some success with but uh i think you're going to see more and more i remember when i first came up you had to have a quarterback started as a fret as a rookie that, that was unheard of and now it seems to be more commonplace so uh, it definitely makes it interesting mike i know you've got to go uh, your thoughts uh, have you had a chance to share any text or have a chance to talk to zach about the next day and 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 where they are and, and kind of give him some advice about working in through the week of a super bowl I don't know, I think he's done a pretty good job on his own. You know, I, I, I kind of left him a message before the game, and I'll probably talk to him tonight, but uh, he's done a pretty good job on his own. Uh, the, the only advice I'd probably give him would be to get the game plan done as early as possible and don't change it. And uh, Mike Holmgren taught me that when we went to the Super Bowl. Uh, you have three days, man, and get, get the game plan done. And uh, once it's done, I don't want a lot of changes because uh, coaches have a tendency to sit around and uh, and massage things a little bit, and then all of a sudden you have a whole brand new offense 
uh, and that offense didn't get you there. So whatever you do in the game plan, do things your players do well and uh, and stick with it. So, um, you know, do do, it, do uh, dance with what brought you uh, with who you brought to the dance. Mike, thank you very much for your time. You're more than uh, uh, helpful. Thank you so much for your insight. Former Packers, longtime NFL, and, of course, college football head coach and the father-in-law of Zach Taylor, the Bengals head coach. Sikkim, 365 Radio and 365 Sports. All right, we will uh, be joined at 4 by Tim Brando, Daryl Johnston today at 4.30, and eventually we'll hear from Ross Tucker on the NFL along with Jordan Lewis, Baylor guard, who is the Big 12 Player of the Week. The city of Woodway, they continue to have one event after another, constantly making sure that you understand that if you go to their website, for example, that father-daughter dance, which is coming up this week, which has been sold out now for about two weeks, there is still a waiting list Although, you better get on it now. Go to discoverwoodway.com. There's at the bottom left-hand corner. It says, again, Father Daughter Dance sold out, but they are continuing. And they are, are looking at opening up just a few more tables inside of the Arboretum, where you can have an event that can be spectacular. Uh, the, it's the Carling Bright Auditorium, the Ar Arboretum. It's just incredible. Weddings, galas, banquets. Uh, it could be business meetings, luncheons, uh, just special gatherings. It's unbelievable. It could seat up to 350 or 60 and sometimes could seat up to even 500 depending on how you set up the room. And coming up in about a week, well, a little bit more than a week, Wolf Way Dog Park. They're going to have the grand opening, yet something else they have that the city of Woodway runs along with all the hiking trails and all the other things they have that are just fantastic. It's a beautiful area. It's the Arboretum to hold your event, a special event, and they could also allow you to have your own caterer cater the deal without it having to be from within inside their own building. So that's up to you on that as well. And seven hotels, if you're going to an event, if you're coming in as a tourist or to come watch Baylor, men's or women's basketball or some event in Waco, it's discoverwoodway.com. Payments for qualified buyers only at 2.9% with 5,000 down cash or trade. TTL Extra. See dealer for details. It's New Year, new ride time at Richard Carr. New Year pre-owned deals like a 2017 Dodge Challenger for $272 a month, a 2019 Ford F-150 for $422 a month, or a 2014 Cadillac CTS sedan for $227 a month. Our vehicles go through a 172-point inspection, and we pay top dollar for your trade. 100% approval is always our goal. Find your next car or truck at Richard Carr. At Richard Carr, we give you more. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trusts. Baylor Scott & White Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics wants to get you back in the game. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness continues to add more weapons to your getting or staying in shape arsenal with eight brand new treadmills ready for you to run or walk a mile or two or ten. And with the explosion of interest in pickleball with instructors Joe Rosa and Jody Thurman with more courts available. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness with large flat screens stretched across the weight room with Wi-Fi available, their own app to enjoy news, business, weather, or sports. Everywhere you look, there's energy, passion, and commitment. New touchless water fountain outside of each locker room and all the locker rooms with showers, sauna, and whirlpool. Upgraded PA system throughout the world-class tennis courts with a youth academy led by pro Britt Colby. Fitness and tennis merchandise available and a tanning bed. I promise you'll look and feel better. You just need to walk through the front door. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness with personal trainers Christy London and Randall Corley. 40 plus group exercise classes including twice a week boot camp. It's time to react today, not tomorrow. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness on Lake Shore Drive drive in Waco. Hey, this is Bryce Petty, former starting quarterback and two-time Big 12 champion. And I know firsthand the importance of being in top shape both on and off the field. So listen up, men. If you're feeling beat down day in and day out and looking for that high-performance edge that separates the men from the boys, then look no further than the Petty Clinic Low T in Waco. Petty Clinic is a comprehensive men's health care clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Board-certified Dr. Kent Petty has a special interest in offering the highest quality medical care to men of all ages. Some of the services offered include 
include screening and treatment for low testosterone or thyroid, infertility, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, while offering comprehensive wellness exams and complete men's health lab panels. High performance men, remember, it's not just a petty thing. This is Bryce Petty, encouraging you to reach out and Google search Petty Clinic Low T or go to PettyClinicLowT.com and get your complimentary lab screening today. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible and rewarding challenge. Hi, this is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like our free First Mobile app, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. That's the First National Bank of Central Texas. Familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. In the market for a quality metal building? Since 1943, Pioneer Steel & Pipe has helped Central Texas residential and commercial customers with metal building design, panel options, building components, and trim options. Pioneer Steel & Pipe's residential line is energy efficient, offers low maintenance, reduces insurance payments, is impact resistant, and carries up to a 45-year limited warranty. In addition, they can also help you find a metal building contractor for your project. Pioneer Steel & Pipe with locations in Waco and Bryan and at PioneersBoys.com. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. Tim Brando in the next hour, Daryl Johnston, Moose Johnson in the next hour, and Baylor guard Jordan Lewis as well. So this is a video. I, I still don't even know who the player is. I've looked everywhere. So Kentucky playing at Allen Fieldhouse against Kansas. They're coming onto the court, and there's one of those up, up near the tunnel scoreboards. It's a big uh, – above the entrance. Watch this video of Kentucky coming onto the court. It just hits that kid right – and now they put Jim Ross. Listen to the audio. I mean that they're having fun with it, but I'm telling you, I don't, I couldn't, I have he, not been able to he, find. He kept running. I'm telling you, that could have like sliced his forehead in half, blinded him, and uh, maybe that was a bad sign that he could handle that, and they went on to just bludgeoned Kansas. It was r- retaliation for the scoreboard. It's interesting to have video with Jim Ross's voice on it on that on the day that Ric Flair is, of course, headed to Lubbock to go be a part of that Texas Tech game against UT. Coming up tomorrow night. Y'all look at me because it's a wrestler, but man, Ric Flair is so <laughs> out of bounds at this stage. Like, that's great. That's cool. I'm sure he'll fire people up. He'll woo it up and all that. But uh, yeah, it's a Ric Flair. Ric Flair. Um, legend. I just, I, I don't know. I'd have to go into a much deeper conversation about Ric Flair to talk about like why I really don't find it as great as maybe other people well, do the but dude's a mess oh no he's a total <laughs> mess it's like uh heard a podcaster say one time rick flair's and i think i've said this on the show before rick flair is one of those guys that we see nowadays and we just pretend that the past didn't happen yeah just one of those guys who lived in a very specific time period where the way he behaved during that time period would never be allowed now and he would be blacklisted in two seconds but for when he was doing what he was doing, he was Ric Flair and it was all acceptable. But like nowadays, you look back at it and it's so cringe. Uh, some of the things that he said or did, and uh, yeah, I mean, he's he, uh, yeah. I think the thing I actually saw on Ric Flair today is not that he's going to Texas Tech, is that he just filed for another divorce. Uh, he's getting divorced once again. So yeah, he'll he'll be fun. He'll fire him up. But man, that dude really needs to. At this stage, he should not be doing college gigs. Ric Flair should be retired with a family and, like, money saved and not taking any more bumps, and instead he's out there and still well, working. And, yeah, he, but uh, I, I, like I, I said, he'll fire him up, I'm sure. Yeah, he will, and he, he was invited by, I think, a radio talk show host or something as well. So he'll be there tomorrow night in Lubbock. When we come back, it will be Tim Brando, Fox Sports, and Daryl Johnson. And they kind of know each other because Fox Sports, of course, with the USFL. Tim Brando with some true serum. Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. IdealMRI.com, Dr. Rob Maxey and his staff. Amazing job and work that they do inside the Central Texas Marketplace. Just off of I-35 on the Access Road, Highway 6. 
where they have a state-of-the-art technology MRI machine. If you have something that bothers you, that hurts, whether a ligament or muscle or something else, and the doctor says, we need to get a better look at that, well, you can't get a better look than what they have, the MRI machine, idealmri.com. And the text and specialist will also be there to help you through the process of the doctors who contact you and even will then send you imagery of whatever they take inside the MRI machine. I've been in there for a shoulder. I've been in there for something else as far as my abdomen that kind of make sure that everything was clear and where it was and maybe not something else that shouldn't have been in there. That's what they can do to make sure they give you peace of mind as well. And on top of that, every single MRI is $497 or less, and they'll help you with the insurance filing. And the average MRI is $1,100 inside the Central Texas Marketplace in Waco, idealmri.com Baylor University is where lights shine bright so let there be light let there be roommates and teammates scholarship and championships let there be fresh starts and new traditions fast friendships and lasting impacts let there be laughter let there be joy let there be light Baylor University where lights shine bright Don's Humidor, you're home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year, Aging Room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carol and Ashley. Don Schumanor in the Townwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. Parenting is full of surprises. You never know what to expect. So after our son was born, I called my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent to set up a life insurance policy in case something happened to me. Sawyer is now two. And we'll soon have a sister. There's no one else I would trust with protecting my family. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Y'all listen up. Let me tell you something about group meals from Rudy's Barbecue. It's got all you need for all the folks you gotta feed, smoke, meat, sides, and more. There's everything down to the tablecloth, just like the one that you see at the store. At a bridal shower, it's better than flowers. And a long business meeting, it'll pass the hours. It'll feed all the cousins at a family function. It's better than potluck at a church luncheon. Next time you need to feed 10 or more, call and order a Rudy's Group Meal. Next in line. It's plain and simple. Waco Custom Marketplace is the one-stop shop for what you need for tailgating from charcoal, cold beer, and wine. And, of course, customize your order with brisket, tri-tips, sausage, wings, smoked pork tenderloin, country-style or pork spare ribs, marinated beef and chicken fajita meat, ground beef and chili, meat, hot dogs, and burgers, buns, seasoning, sauces, chips. There's fresh-baked bread and kolaches every day, breakfast sausage links, and you can also customize your favorite favorite cut of steaks from select choice or prime bacon wrap fillets ribeyes new york strip sirloin t-bone and porterhouse full service butcher shop includes pork poultry beef chicken and seafood serving waco restaurants and families since 1940 your one-stop shop for beef pork poultry and seafood needs waco custom marketplace 425 lake air drive or waco custom marketplace.com Sports bettors, it is that fantastic time of year. The NFL playoffs, the Super Bowl, college basketball, the NBA, all of that coming up right now and with great action at BetUS.com, the three-decade leader. And right now, for just 50 bucks, you can get in with our promo codes, SICKEM125 for 125% bonus on cash or SICKEM200, that's a 200% bonus on crypto. So go to BetUS.com today. 50 bucks gets you 125% bonus on cash or 200% on crypto with our promo codes, SICKEM125 and SICKEM200. That's at BetUS.com. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. From 31 yards, McPherson and Cincinnati is heading to the Super Bowl. 
the 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. We have a couple other stories we will get to, at least tease you with them. One is uh, Grambling State University now comes up with an NIL deal for their student-athletes. We'll have that as well. And it's a huge week in Texas for high school sports because of what they do on, well, Wednesday's the, the what used to be the only national signing day, and it's more of a down version, a, a, a smaller version of December. But also Thursday is when everyone finds out who's in their district when it comes to high school athletics and various sports as well. We are now joined by uh, Tim Brando, Fox Sports, who has been, man, I, I mean, from the Hall of Fame last week, Tim, I saw you on that, to the Super Bowl was set, to the audio yesterday during CBS at halftime, I saw you. Let's start with that because you've been in the business and sometimes, you know, things happen technically. That was unbelievable what CBS had to deal with, but they just kept on plugging away. Well, David, that's all you can do when you're in that situation. My heart goes out to, to JB and and uh, all the guys that were on that set, but particularly him because he's the one that's uh, trying to play traffic cop and um, elicit comments from uh, the guys uh, that are on the on the desk with him. And when you can't hear one another, it's hard to react. And not only could they not hear one another, none of us could hear anything because of the mix. I um. I, I don't know. Has anything been written today by any of the of the media scribes about uh, what the problem was? Did CBS ever address it? Because I, you know, it could have been, it could have been a myriad of different things that forced the you know that that problem upon them. I've been in similar situations, um, but not anything like that. That was cataclysmic. I mean, I, I don't know that that's ever happened, uh, particularly at an NFL game when when everything that's being produced. Uh, is is running in concert with the clock with the National Football League, as, as it would be for anything that we do uh, at the SEC Championship for years. I was, you know, doing an hour-long pregame show and halftime shows for all those years in Atlanta, and nothing like that ever happened to us. Did they ever address it? Did, no. Did you see anything on it? No, CBS, I don't think, has released anything. The only thing that I saw, Tim, was uh, Boomer Esiason on his radio show just commenting on it, saying that they had no idea they were going to have those speakers behind them, and, and I, apparently he he played along with it and, you know, didn't take it too seriously, but, yeah, he was just kind of flummoxed like everybody else. Well, that was – if those speakers were there and, and uh, the technicians and – uh, stage managers and the producer of that halftime show uh, were not informed. That's on the league. I mean, that's a problem. You know, that's 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 the league not communicating to the network. So, you know, things happen. It's live TV, <laughs> and, and and gaps will occur from time to time. But that certainly looked like an unforced error. And uh, I think most people in television, most people that are in our business, uh, were thinking, well, surely they had a an understanding that there was going to be music being played, but uh, wh where those amplifiers were set and where those speakers were going out to the, the entire stadium should not have been uh, anywhere near, you know, the location where they were broadcasting from. So it happens, you know. <laughs> I, Tim, I, I, I just I feel really badly for those guys though because you got to, you know, it, it, you're there. You've only got a short time to give your thoughts, and then when no one can hear each other, that's a, that's a problem. Tim, I, in, in a weird, perverse way, it made me feel good as someone in, in local broadcasting that uh, we've had to do shows times where the, the the you know college bands just show up on the scene and in the middle of our interview just start blaring. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you're like, well, I mean, what can you do? Like, you can't just run in the uh, middle of 300 people and be like, you got to move. Yeah. Go. I mean, yeah. you just got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't expect that, though, uh, with anything remotely connected to the National Football League. They're like a well-oiled machine when it comes to their halftime shows and just game management in general. Uh, and and those kinds of the, 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 the memos that pass through producers' emails uh, in the weeks that lead up to any broadcast are, are incredible. And then for championship game environments – uh, even more so. Uh, that would be true at any major event. And, and I've been in their situation, so, but I've never had to deal with that uh, to the extent to which they did. So 
uh, it was it was surprising, no question. Tim, how amazing is this Joe Burrow kid, huh? I mean, uh, Jamar Chase, uh, you know, Jamar Chase, I think, has to be mentioned as well, uh, the LSU duo, but uh, this this Burrow story is, is pretty unbelievable. He is, a, he is a, a cool hand Luke, and I don't think there's any doubt that if you're looking for, you know, the next, um, the, the, the next big thing in quarterbacking that's probably considered more throw first, and run second, he's that guy. Uh, okay, a, a combination of, uh, of, uh, of Brady and Manning, perhaps, but probably more mobile than both. Uh, I mean, Joe, you know, was a big factor running the football uh, in the LSU offense when they won the national title, uh, much more so than probably people realize. Uh, not, mess, you know, but, but by comparison to Josh Allen, not nearly as mobile. Uh, okay, and I, I thought Cincinnati uh, would beat um, um, – I thought they would win the game, and I thought they would win it, you know, with relative ease against Kansas City because the Chiefs were coming off such an incredible game uh, that, you know, the high from winning a game like that and having to do all that they did in the fourth quarter, to you just – you look for an emotional letdown. But they were anything but that in the first half. I mean, it was just the opposite. Kansas City was blowing – Cincinnati's doors off and they needed to make major adjustments in their uh, defense and they did in the second half shockingly so and uh, Burrow did just enough with very little offensive line help uh, to, to keep them in the game to keep them within contact and then uh, after the defense started making stops now you know offensively they really began to make plays I'll tell you fellas if Cincinnati wins it all and I think they will. I think they're going to beat the Rams. Uh, they will be with the worst offensive line to win a Super Bowl maybe in the modern era of, of, of the NFL. That, that, that line is just not very good. And he's doing it despite them. Yeah, I, I thought I heard either Nant or someone mention that it may have been a postgame show or one of those that he's been sacked more than any quarterback ever to get to a Super Bowl. <laughs> ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so much so that he got hurt, you know, obviously last year uh, and didn't get to play. Only only won two games as a starter. Uh, they only won four, period. But they, they were able to, you know, uh, get through the season and then have him have enough time to get healthy uh, to start the year. I don't think we can uh, disregard the jobs done by Mixon, you know, in the backfield as well. Uh, and, and T. Higgins – who's been a great, you know, third, you know, they, there's that saying in the NFL, you're only as good as your third option. And, and they, they've certainly seemingly found that uh, in, in a second and a third option to uh, Jamar Chase. But but Joe Burrow has great um, in the pocket and his ability to elude at least the first, the first one or two guys to get to him to keep a play alive is just off the charts. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And um, he's just got one of those heartbeats that's a lot slower than everybody else no his age. Yeah. I mean, he really does. And uh, you know that from the moment you meet him. And uh, Spencer Tillman and I were on hand when he won the Lombardi uh, right after LSU had uh, won the national championship. And he, you would not meet a, a better young man than that. And uh, he had just, of course, come off the Heisman uh, a week earlier maybe 10 days earlier, and, you know, he was as grateful and as humble, but at the same time, confident. You know, that, that fine line between uh, superior confidence uh, and arrogance, I mean, he walks that as well as any young quarterback I think I've ever seen. Tim, uh, I, I watched this and I thought about this when we were, you know, we, we knew we were going to have you on the show today. It, it kind of constantly happens to me when I think about college football. Why doesn't college football just take something that works and reformat it to fit what they do? The NFL the last month has been fantastic. Everything yeah, about yeah. it is a ratings winner all the time. Yet college right. football seems so determined to do their own thing, even despite of knowing what works. Yeah. I mean, if you were to take the time for, for all those people, and it's amazing, isn't it? How many people consistently, the only people that shout down the notion of having a 12-team 
uh, format for the college football playoff are those that are consistently saying, well, you know, we're just going to have more blowouts. How the hell do you know? How the hell? Who anointed you Nostradamus that every game is going to? No, you're not. You're going to get better quality football. When teams are playing games that matter to advance to another round of the playoffs, it only enables them to become better at their craft because so much more is on the line. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you, take, for instance, a team like Pittsburgh with a quarterback like Kenny Pickett, who's going to be the, the, the number one quarterback taken in this upcoming draft. I mean, Pitt, under any other circumstances, going to a New Year's Six Bowl after what they've been through would have been off the charts, incredibly pumped up, ready to go, and they would have been in the top 12. I mean, they would have been in the in the mix. Uh, but you put them in a game without anything at stake, and the quarterback leaves, doesn't participate in their New Year's Six game. Well, they're a shell of their former selves. Who the hell's going to watch that? Who wants to sponsor that? So, I mean, if you can't look at this and not see the light, and I'm speaking more really here to, to the, I mean, just absolute short-sighted elitist fans of the, of the four or five pure playoff privileged teams out there that don't want any change to take place. My God, do you not like football? <laughs> because all you're going to get is a lot more and a lot better football by going to a 12-team format. Uh, and you don't surrender the entire month of December, the entire month of December, to the NFL. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And I've seen you on that before. You're just giving up days that otherwise would have eyeballs that would watch whatever. I, I, I saw college basketball. Kentucky throttled Kansas. Alabama, who's bipolar uh, with what they do <laughs> in, in basketball, what they did to Baylor yeah. and and then obviously uh, the others, but the Providence game, Purdue, and, and that game oh. ending, uh, it was a it was a remarkable weekend for college basketball. It really was. It really was, and it always delivers. And again, it's a shame that so many helmet heads won't look at college basketball until the Super Bowl is over, and they're missing out because these teams are evolving into the teams they're going to be watching in March, and they're all going to be asking the same stupid questions they all ask when the tournament pairings come out and they're missing out on who's doing what and how they're evolving. Um, Purdue had uh, uh, the game salted away at a 16 point lead and Ohio state kept chipping away. EJ Liddell started making shots. And the next thing you know, they're stealing an inbounds pass and tying the thing up. <laughs> and Purdue has one chance to win it at the end. And, and you could argue that it was a questionable shot, but Ivy is so good at hitting game winners and he does it again uh with really no time remaining a buzzer beater uh to give purdue the win and, and they'll probably be top four this week i've got them this coming saturday at home against michigan a game the wolverines really need to win uh, that's a game you'll see on fox at 2 30 uh central 3 30 eastern time I'm, I'm looking forward to that one um michigan's you know 500 in the big 10 and they did get a win at Indiana right after Indiana beat Purdue uh, a little over a week ago. And, and uh, Juwan's team you know, got buried at uh, East Lansing. So they, they need to get some quad one wins. It'll be interesting to see. As of your, your point about Alabama, you know, Quinterly is a kid that um, their point guard is a kid that transferred from Villanova because he couldn't get enough playing time. And he was a five-star talent coming out of high school. And, uh, you know, he played like it. Uh, in the game against Baylor after they had lost to Georgia, who's been awful mm -hmm. this year in the SEC. So, yeah, it's going to happen. But I guarantee you when the lights go up and it's a big game and it was the SEC Big 12 Challenge, which I think is uh, amongst regular season weekends, probably one of the more prized uh, weekends of college basketball, particularly in the Midwest and the flyover states and in the Rust Belt of the South, uh, it was important to those guys, and they played like it. Uh, you know, uh, the modern-day Internet athlete, whether he's football or basketball, they want to play in games that matter. And those games this past weekend mattered. And uh, I would argue that while some people say, well, you know, I don't really pay attention to the tournament, I would say, well, then you're missing the hell out. You're missing a lot because these teams, you know, become who they are in March 
you know, in, in the, in the latter stages of January and all of February. Tim, last year, if you asked most college basketball pundits and people around the country who's going to be playing on the first Monday in April, they would have been like Gonzaga and Baylor. And if you asked them a month later, they'd say Gonzaga and Baylor. This year, I think if you asked people, I don't think you'd get the same answer from any two people. This college basketball no. season is as wide open as one we've, we've maybe ever seen. Yeah, you're right. And I think, uh, you know, I saw Kentucky a little over a month ago uh, at LSU when they dedicated Dale Brown Court. So that was actually a little less than a month ago. It was January the 4th. And they were not the same team that played uh, at Kansas the other day. Uh, now LSU was at full strength, and, and they haven't been really since that game. They Xavier Pinson was out for the game with TCU. He's their best point guard. He's he's a guy that can really run an offense. LSU is now, you know, they're an athletic team without real basketball skill sets when they don't have Xavier Pinson. And uh, Days, who's their best inside player, had also been out. He just got back for the TCU game. But Kentucky with Shibwe and, and those guards, they really took it to, to Kansas, would not allow them to get anything accomplished on the, the offensive glass. And you could see the athletic prowess that Kentucky had. Uh, all these teams, uh, when they're getting players and losing players, either through injury, COVID protocols, or whatever else might happen, uh, it impacts them. You lose one or two guys, no matter how good you might be, and it's um, uh, you know it's it's questionable as as to whether you're worth uh, really worthy of the numeral that's next to your name. Uh, I think Purdue is the most complete team I've seen, but even they don't have a prolific, pure point guard. Like if if you took, for instance, Colin Gillespie of Villanova, who I think is the best pure point guard and leader of a team in college basketball this year. If you put him with Purdue, I don't know that they could lose. Uh, Edie is a monster. He's like 7'4", runs the floor like he's 6'7". You've got Travion Williams, who's now coming off the bench, who is just a big-time talent, an all-Big Ten player of the year uh, preseason candidate. And then you've got all these great guards, and Stefanovic, who can shoot the lights out from deep. But they don't have a guy that you can give the ball to and say, okay, make sure that we protect the ball and that we handle pressure late in games. Ohio State proved that uh, the other day. You know, same thing with Baylor. You saw what happened. They were not with – they didn't have prior their best score, and you saw the difference in them, right? I mean, against Alabama. So every team in college basketball is susceptible. Everyone's got some small wart, okay, meaning – no one, not even Gonzaga, is uh, is without you know flaws. And um, Auburn is another team that I think falls into this category now. Uh, they've got a big seven footer, the transfer uh, Kessler, that can make a big difference in the way you know teams attack the ten against Auburn. Uh, and they certainly run the floor well for Bruce Pearl. But what if they're not making shots? What if they need to protect the ball? Uh, and get a good look against the team that's forcing them to play half court. I think they're susceptible. I think there's vulnerabilities there. So, yeah, it's going to be just an amazing uh, NCAA tournament. And I, I, for one, can't wait for the, uh, the, the really, the, the, the dog days of February that I'm about to jump into. You know, I've got games, like I said, Michigan and Purdue this Saturday, come back the following Tuesday with Villanova at St. John's. I get Providence, who's playing out of their minds uh, at uh, Villanova uh, a little bit later in February. That could probably be, that game might be for the regular season championship of the Big East. Certainly seeding in that conference tournament is going to be a blast. And I think the Big 12, the Big East, and uh, and the SEC, those three leagues, uh, and, and the Pac-12 is top-heavy, okay? They've got... Oregon's really good. So is SC. So is UCLA. But there's a there, there's a drop off after that. You know, I see the three best leagues with multiple teams. You know, upwards of seven, eight teams getting in. The Big Ten, the Big Twelve, uh, the Big East, and the SEC are just they're all loaded. I mean, I, it, it's hard to determine. The only difference would be there are fewer teams in the Big East, so they won't get as many teams in the tournament maybe as the other three. But my goodness, those are great leagues with a lot of good teams. I mean, a lot of good teams. Tim, um, 
you know, I mean, a lot. <laughs> Tim, before we let you go, you've talked about Michigan hoops a little bit. I'm curious your thoughts on Jim Harbaugh, another flirtation with the NFL, talking with the Vikings. I saw, you know, Dolphins fans want uh, them to pursue him as well. But uh, your thoughts on Harbaugh and Michigan? Well, I don't understand why you're going to run Zimmer when you've got a team returning. It's not bad. You know, they've got Dalvin Cook as a runner. They've got, a, I would say, a better than average starting quarterback in Cousins. Um, uh, you know, I like their receiving core. Um, I don't think it's a, you know, it's not superstar laden. They may, they may need one more big time, uh, threat, you know, deep threat in their receiving core. But I don't know that you necessarily have to run Zimmer to get Harbaugh. If that's the only place that's really interested, um, to me, if I'm Jim, I- I'm thinking, well, all right, if I'm going to throw myself back into this, then I must not believe that what I accomplished this year is sustainable. You know, Michigan had a hell of a year. And I think a lot of people are saying he's definitely going to go out because he beat Ohio State. That's what the Michiganders wanted. He got them into the playoff. That's a good thing. Now they got embarrassed in the playoff. So if he just leaves, I don't know that that. I mean, I know that they're happy with him, and he's one of their own, and he could, some say, go out riding hot. If he wants to coach so badly in the NFL, uh, you know, the Vikings would be a great place to land. I mean, it would. I just don't understand why Minnesota would be that enamored with him. The Raiders weren't. You know, there was talk about the Raiders being the team that, that might procure him, and all reports out of there is that's just not going to happen. Um Maybe, maybe it's a money thing. Maybe he feels like he can't get out of Michigan what he can get out of the NFL. He wants to make another big strike, and, and, and he has to go to the league to do that. Um, look, I, 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 I'm a bit biased here. I want to see Jim Harbaugh stay in the Big Ten. I want to see Michigan continue to be uh, relevant, okay, and battling Ohio State. But um, I think there's a push by some in the media – uh, to get him out and back into the NFL. And I don't quite get why Minnesota would be so enamored with Jim Harbaugh. I know you uh, have something else to get to, but I I saw your back and forth, the debate about the Baseball Hall of Fame, Clemens, Bonds, <laughs> whatever. And we don't have time for you to get into it, but but who's the commissioner who oversaw baseball during that time? Oh, my God. Well, it was it was the one and only Bud Seeley. And he's in the Hall of Fame, right? He's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the best of all the arguments. And I've said that before. <laughs> Baseball looked the other way like a like you're getting, a, you, you know, you're physical. Like, turn right and cough. And they and, did. And, and, and then they want to do what they do now. I got to tell you, I was vilified in the time in the early 2000s when the home run chase was going on between Sosa and McGuire and uh and bonds and and during that entire era and i i absolutely shredded major league baseball and at that time i actually had some producers that were out of chicago with sporting news radio and they were all cubs fans and they just were like uh, in my ear like you wouldn't believe it i'm like i I don't care what you guys think whether you're south siders or your uh your your cubby fans it's it's a joke it's a crock and you've got you guys are as much a part of the problem as uh, as the players are, okay? <laughs> of course, I didn't win too many friends or influence my producers when I said that, but I really felt it. Uh, I had left calling Major League games in 96 with the Braves. Uh, the steroid era was well underway at that point in time. Uh, I had been to batting practices and had seen the colossal jerks that were, you know, superstars of, of the MLB at that time. Barry Bonds at the very top of that heap. Uh, I covered college baseball when he played for Jim Brock at Arizona State. Barry Bonds did not have to take uh, PEDs to be a, a Hall of Famer. I mean, he was a Hall of Famer even before he got on those. No question in my mind. But he did it, and he almost did it with a, a smug sneer saying, uh, you know, say whatever you want. I'm doing it. They don't mind, and that's that. Um the ESPN even sent the late Pedro Gomez to go follow him. Can you imagine that being your job, having to follow Barry Bonds <laughs> every day of, of the summer? I mean, my God, what a sickening job to have in media. Um, 
because the guy was a jerk, absolute jerk. And uh, but yet, all of the Hall of Fame uh, media, uh, Peter Gammons and and many many others, were complicit with this. Wouldn't say a word about it. And uh, now all of a sudden, we're years removed from it. The game has done as much as it can to clean it all up after the embarrassment uh, at uh, Capitol Hill when uh, Roger Clemens misremembered and Rafael Palmero lied. Uh, now all of a sudden, uh, we're supposed to just just forget about all of that. Okay, we all have amnesia from it, and we're supposed to put him in. I I thought at that time. No way, no how should any of these guys get in. But Selig was the commissioner at that time. He's He's been removed for a long time. He's now in mm-hmm. Cooperstown. Yep. So if he's in, how the hell can you justify not allowing Bonds in, not allowing Sosa in, not allowing Clemens in, not allowing Palmero in? So it's, it's, it's just a huge blemish for the entire sport. And for many respected journalists, all members of the Baseball Writers Association, and their hypocrisy. It's an absolute hypocrisy. And sadly, I think it's a uh, uh, another bad skin on the wall for sports mirroring society. You know, we have hypocrisy all around us, and we don't need it in sports. The, the one thing about sports that we could always hang our hat on was that no matter where you came from, no matter your ethnicity, no matter the makeup of your uh, cultural uh, background, you can excel between the white lines. <laughs> but but the way we treat these players, you know, I think of all the guys that played during that period when, when juicing was taking place and their careers were cut short because they didn't. Okay, a guy like Todd Walker from my own town played 10 years in the big leagues, great hitter, played for the Cubs, played for the Red Sox. Uh, played for the uh, the Twins. Yeah, Todd was a Golden Spikes Award winner at LSU with Skip Berkman in the early 90s. Todd, Todd probably could have played 10, 12 more years if he had juiced. He, he chose not to. Um, and there are a lot of other guys like that that fall into that category. So I think it's a real shame. Uh, I do. Hey, before I go, uh, fellas, I do want to mention this because I think you're going to have Moose Johnson on next. Yes, sir. I am so stoked that the USFL is coming back. And uh, I don't know that I'll be involved. I probably won't uh, be involved uh, with it. But but I am so stoked it's returning. Uh, back in 1985, uh, my first year uh, on national television at ESPN, I got to call Herschel Walker's record-breaking touchdown run to break uh, Eric Dickerson's single-season rushing record at that time. And um, it was one of the golden moments of a young career for me. And I was only 29 back then. And uh, I just think the business model, everything that the guys have done uh, at Fox to make this a reality, I think it's going to be a huge success this spring. I really do. And uh, I wanted to say that before you guys got uh, Moose on. Yeah, we had a graphic up early. It was my fault about his role. He's the executive vice president of football operations. He is next. We'll tell him you said hello. And I look forward. Yeah, I will. And, Tim, thank you, as always, for the truth serum and how you say it as well. Thanks for your time. (laughs) Okay, fellas, thanks again. Anytime, you know that. Tim Brando, Fox Sports, broadcaster on many things. And uh, I I say this about him, and I put this up just now on Twitter. You you may not agree or you may disagree on occasion with one of his opinions. We don't agree on everything, but he says it emphatically, and he also says it with conviction, and we appreciate him jumping on with us on average really about once a month on many things sports. Uh, including his background and uh, knowledge about what Joe Burrow was like, of course, at LSU as well. We'll have Daryl Johnston here in a moment from the USFL joining us on Sikkim 365 Radio. He is now the uh, the executive vice president of football operations of the USFL, of course, member of the Cowboys in that great dynasty in the 90s. And Daryl Johnston joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Daryl, thank you as always. Paul Craig, David Smoke, we just had Tim Brando on. He said hello, and he said he is stoked about the USFL launching and getting themselves back. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Always great to visit with Tim. Daryl, what is this like for you? Uh, you have been a part of leagues that have tried, and then this one seems to have some uh, 
It has some uh, some roots that are digging and, and moving forward and, and the excitement of being a part of something new like this. Yeah, I think it was just, you know, it was unusual circumstances. The other two go around, um, you know, one that was kind of within our control um, a little bit with the alliance, you know, not having, you know, somebody that was really committed to funding and, and being that, that individual angel investor moving forward. Uh, and then when we changed paths, um, you know, I think at that time there was there was a lot of question as to the responsibility of some of the accounts uh, once things switched hands and we just really couldn't reach any point of uh, conclusion as to how we should move forward. So uh, with the alliance, um, you know, that was a tough one because I, I really I, I thought Charlie and Bill Polian did a great job. And if all the guys that we've talked to and seen since that time still look back on those days very fondly. Uh, a lot of them will tell us it's the most fun they've had playing football since they were in high school. And, and that's, that's what we're hoping to do with all these leagues. The XFL, the pandemic got us. Um, you know, I think that Vic, Vince McMahon, if you really kind of look at what happened to him during that time, um, you know, the hit that the WWE took on its stock price, uh, you know, his net worth, you know, dropped considerably during that whole process. And he was the the singer payer of all the expenses. So it was, it was a little bit too much. And, and what could we do moving forward? Um, you know, do you pause and hold on or do you just hold your tent and, and try again later on? So, uh, you know, they'll be coming online next year and, and we look forward to, to competing against them. But I, I, I think you make a great point. I think there's so much history with the USFL and, and so many people remember it fondly um, that, this has already got some roots that we can use to our advantage. And, and that's going to be one of the great things. Um, you know, some of the players that were there, I think people forget that that's Reggie White and Jim Kelly and Herschel Walker and Steve Young and Mike Rogier and Irv Eatman. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. You know, Nate Newton was a part of, of the USFL mm-hmm. first go around. So we've stayed traditional with the uniforms. We've modernized them a little bit with, with colors, but we haven't changed a whole lot. Um, so we're, we're really excited about it. We're really excited to, to launch this and, you know, just talking to some people, you know, I had an opportunity to visit with Vince Papali and, and he was a part of the Philadelphia Stars. They, they still have a reunion every year. So we're going to we're going to try and tap into that during the course of the season, get a watch party going back at one of the places uh, that they, they do that back in Philadelphia. And and hopefully we'll get groups coming down to Birmingham, Alabama to watch uh, to watch the teams that they remember from back in the 80s. Daryl, how much did you guys go back into the UFL, USFL's history and, and make sure you 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 learned uh, from what the mistakes were made early on? Uh, with the, you know, they, they expanded way too fast and got really way out over their skis and a lot of things. I know you guys aren't going to do, but just kind of some of the little things that happened in the USFL that that led to the the screws getting loose and ultimately it falling apart. Well, I think the big thing is is you know you, you can't take on the NFL, not even at that time. You know, it, you know, we're, we're talking 40 years removed now, but that, I mean, the, the NFL at that time was, was still, you know, kind of a powerhouse and it was the standard in professional football. And, um, you know, it's visionary uh, and it's bold, you know, to try and take them on and compete with them. But I, I, I just think the way they started out where they had the offset calendar was, was the best option for them. Um, you know, build it there, build it in that time frame. Um, you know, continue to build your fan base because as we just talked about, there's, there's a lot of people that love the USFL. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We, we, nobody's going to be able to go head to head with the NFL. It's just not going to happen. Um, but, but you also don't want to feel like you're a dev- a developmental league for them. You, you know, you have to find that, that sweet spot where, you know, we're not, we're not competing with the NFL. Uh, we're working with them, but we're not developing players for their soul's sake. The, the way that I do it is I'm doing it for the individual players. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get them in a position where we can work on their craft and get them around great coaches and great teachers and whatever it is that they're missing, whatever it is that's preventing them from getting to the NFL, we're going to be able to help them, you know, fix that, uh, you know, get used to being in a professional organization, get used to the verbiage, get used to the day in, day out, uh, you know, for the offensive linemen, for the quarterbacks, get some quality game reps in there. Uh, and then when they come off the backside, you know, our calendar is still – it's still NFL training camp friendly, especially the way camps are held today. You've, you're not as physical. You're starting a little bit later in the month of July, sometimes even in August. You've got an acclimation period. So if you win the championship game in the USFL, you will play it on January or July 2nd. Uh, and that still gives those guys plenty of time to, to kind of heal up a little bit. They're going to be in football shape. I think they're going to be ahead of the curve going in. I think they're going to be, uh, they're going to be the individual players that kind of pop at the beginning of practice. 
Daryl, you guys have eight teams. Uh, Michigan, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Birmingham, Houston, New Orleans, and Tampa Bay. But you're this first season going to play all of these games in Birmingham, uh, two different sites. And I saw where I, I know the hope is to eventually expand and where teams will play at their own home sites. But can you talk about the decision to go into that and just the market that is Birmingham, Alabama, and their love for football? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's pretty impressive. We were down in Birmingham last Monday and and Tuesday, and and, and the one thing I learned right away is it's it's the state of Alabama, it's not <laughs> Alabama. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, the, the the passion for the the game of football, um, the way that the city has embraced and and really not just embraced, but kind of pursued the opportunity to be, you know, a high quality, high caliber sports town. Uh, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, Prospective Stadium is is beautiful. Uh, the seating capacity is perfect for us. It's the home field for UAB. Um, we think it's going to be a great home for all of our teams there. Uh, we will be at Legion Field from time to time. Uh, I think we're scheduled to play eight to twelve games at Legion, um, but but the real home base is going to be Prospective, and, and it's a beautiful stadium. Uh, that, that whole area around the stadium is is really kind of turned around. Uh, it, it's it's perfect for what we're trying to do. There's a world games there right after our season ends. So, you know, the city of Birmingham has already, you know, landed, you know, a, a professional sports league as, as the host city, uh, you know, for, for a time. And then they've also encouraged and, and, and found a way to get the world games there. So they're already well down the path to, uh, to, to becoming that kind of sports destination. Uh, and, and I'm excited to see, you know, what they do moving forward. Uh, you know, everybody we met there, uh, was excited. Um, you know, they talked about the challenges and how everybody kind of came together for the good of the city, for the good of the state of Alabama, uh, for this opportunity. So we're, we're really excited. We're really excited to be able to bring uh, this product down there to the city of Birmingham. And, and Daryl, there's no question, you know, the Big 12 had to change because of Texas and Oklahoma and eventually whenever they leave for the SEC. And so they've added new teams. And there's no question Memphis uh, in, in that area. I mean, it's football crazy, as Craig mentioned, uh, and, and Birmingham and UAB and the the the, the love of football in the South is, is, is that makes it the perfect place to start. Absolutely, absolutely. It was it was one of those things we played Auburn in the Sugar Bowl my junior year of college, and and it was one of the things that we heard all week. Uh, is you 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 boys from up north don't know how to play football down here in the South. Um, you know, and we we use that as as personal motivation for us. Um, so yeah, th- there's there's the history. Of, of these great programs in the South, the conferences, the individual players, the coaches. Uh, I mean, it, it really is a religion, you know, whether it's college Saturday or pro Sunday, uh, but especially, you know, that college football, um, you know, the high school football scene in the South is, is, is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So, you know, we, we couldn't really have landed in a better place to launch this. Um, so we really look forward to, to, to a really, really positive relationship with, with not only, you know, the, the city of, of Birmingham, but really becoming a part of that community down there. We've already got some things in place, you know, kind of plant some seeds there, and, and hopefully we'll continue to grow those through through year number one. What have you learned from the previous experiences? Uh, Paul mentioned that some of them grow too fast or that things go. Your thoughts about, and, and your name, it, there's no question. I'm not saying this because you're on with us. I've known you for a long time. Your name attached to this doesn't hurt either, does it? Hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I hope I've learned. I hope I've learned from the first two. Um, you know, we talked about the circumstances surrounding both of them, but there were some things within our control that contributed to that. And, and I think the first one is getting out over your skis, like you guys said, and and being a little bit aggressive financially year one. That's why I like you know what we're doing with the USFL here in year one, doing the hub concept, eliminating all those travel costs, not having the eight individual franchises across the you know, across the United States. Um, you know, travel was one of the hardest things to, to, to navigate, you know, as we started out. So we, we've taken that right away. Um, so I, I think that that's a huge plus. You, you just minimize all your expenses w- when you're doing the hub concept. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we, we saw from what happened during the pandemic when the WNBA and the NBA and the MLS went down to Florida and, and they, they did the bubble concept. You know, they, we're similar to that, but we're not a bubble. We're, just, we're a hub. Uh, and everything's just going to come out of Birmingham. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to give us a great opportunity to get off that first year on a, on a sound footing, you know, work through the other logistical things that, that we have to learn and have to get better at during the course of the year without really putting a, a huge hit on our finances. So hopefully year two, um, you know, we turn the corner, uh, we, we get to year two, which is something that I'm really, really excited 
to accomplish because the other two times we never got to, to, to learn from our mistakes in year one and advance and grow and get better in year two. And that's, that's one of the things I'm, I'm really hoping to do this time around. I, I know we're going to be good in year one and I want to be really good in year two and then great in year three. Daryl, you see now who's in the Super Bowl. You spent part of your life in that with the, the dynasty of the Cowboys. Your thoughts about what it takes, and yes, talent, great quarterback play, this and that, some luck along the way. Your thoughts about what we have with Cincinnati and what they've done, and the Rams, they've built it differently because they've gone to where they've gone out and grabbed stars. Yeah, kind of two different models, right? Uh, you know, Cincinnati has, has taken that, that traditional path of, of bringing in a new coach and, and acquiring the players and the talent, you know, that fit his system and, and gradually grow. And from, from two and two and 14 to four and 12 to the Super Bowl. I mean, that, that, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, we had them week one. So, you know, we were very familiar with what had transpired in the off season and, and Cincinnati committed to the defense. Uh, they spent a hundred million dollars in contracts on the defensive side of the ball. Trey Hendrickson, obviously probably your biggest signing, uh, that was there, um, you know, that was the Russian that, that came in from, from New Orleans, uh, but just a, you know, quality guy throughout that, that defensive front and, and Lou Anaromo, what, what he was able to do against Kansas city in the second half of that game on Sunday was, was absolutely amazing. The defensive coordinator made some great adjustments at halftime and you're adjusting through that whole first half, trying to slow him down a little bit, which they did, but, but they really kind of locked in in that second half. So you, you've got the traditional way of building it the way that Cincinnati has, uh, they've, they've got what many consider to be, you know, a, a definite franchise quarterback running that show right now. And, and, you know, that was one of the things that, that I took away that week one uh, experience in Cincinnati is, is Joe Burrow's got a lot of swagger to him. Um, he, he reminded me of Troy and I know people are going to say, you know, that, you know, that's crazy. And I'm not saying he is Troy, but that, that it thing the thing that you can't really coach that really has to be kind of a part of your personality. I mean, you could see Joe, you know, very calculated with his responses. Um, you know, you could tell that he was going to hold people accountable the way he controlled practice. Uh, it, it was really impressive to see a young guy coming off a major injury, um, you know, still have that confidence and swagger. And I think we've seen it come out a number of times during the course of the year. Uh, and then you've got the Rams. I mean, I, I was, I was really nervous for them, you know, the midpoint of the year when they, they just decided, you know, hey, we're, we're going after this. You know, they'd already brought in Matthew Stafford. Um, you know, during the course of the season, they, they bring in Odell Beckham. They bring in Vaughn Miller. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing, you know, that what, they've, what they've really rolled the dice with here when you talk about what is your future going to be because they've lost all their draft picks. Um, I think it's 2020. Four before they have a first round draft pick, yep. maybe longer than that. It's ridiculous. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you are you are all in at this point, and if it blows up, uh, which it looked like it was going to when when it's seventeen seven San Francisco, um, you know you you've leveraged your future for a one shot deal to to be able to play in your home stadium at the Super Bowl, and and that that almost slipped through your fingers. So I, I give them a lot of credit for for. You know, being being gutsy and, and making that call and committing to it and you know getting everybody on board. Um, so you know, it, it was a it was an impressive win, and, and I'm I'm really really happy for Matthew Stafford to have the opportunity, you know, to finally at this stage of his career get that Super Bowl experience. Daryl, final thing for you: uh, the Cowboys are going to be home watching once again. I mean, they got to the playoffs; we all saw that. Jerry's tried to do the go out and get stars thing, and he's also tried to do the let's let's build it up more in home. Uh, your thoughts on, on Dallas's season and how tough do you think it is for you know the franchise to be home again watching some other teams in the Super Bowl and that that clock just continuing to grow larger and larger since their last appearance? Yeah, it's amazing how long it's been now. Um, it, it's going to be hard, but it was one of those weird years. I think what makes it harder is it was anybody's Super Bowl. I mean, I don't think anybody really had a great idea of who the matchup was going to be. I think in, in, in years prior, we, we always had a pretty good idea of who was going to make it through. Um, I, I, I mean, you lose your, your number one seeds, you know, divisional weekend, both of them, um, you know, it, there was a potential to be a six, four Super Bowl, And I don't know if it's ever been, you know, that far down the rankings where a six was, was playing a four in the Super Bowl. But if San Francisco would have pulled off that victory, you know, that's what you would have had. And, and that's the way the season was. I mean, there were times during the course of the season where it looked like it was going to be the bills and then it looked like it was going to be the chiefs. Then it was the Rams early on. Then it was the Buccaneers. 
you know, the Cowboys would pop, you know, from time to time. Uh, but you never really had a team that really kind of solidified itself all the way through the year and got on that, that really great run. So, you know, San Francisco seemed to be that team at the end of the year, having to win those games to get into the, into the playoffs. And you just thought they were going to carry it all the way to the Super Bowl. But th- this is going to be a tough one for Dallas because this was a year where, where there really was nobody that had run away with everything during the course of the season. So what you really needed to do was come in and play one month of really good football. And they were not able to do that. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's going to be the, the biggest disappointment for them. I, I did not like all the Mike McCarthy needs to leave, needs to be fired. Um, you know, it's, it, it's poor execution uh, at the end of the game. And, you know, I, I, I listened to everything that they said about that 14 seconds, and they had practiced it. Um, they, they felt very comfortable in that time frame. Um, and it's just a situation where all of a sudden, you know, the middle of the field is wide open and, and, and Dak carries a little bit too far down the field. Um, you've got a situation uh, where the umpire is not, you know, trailing the play properly. So you had some officiating mechanics. You had some execution mechanics that, that, that weren't perfect. And when you've only got 14 seconds left and you don't have a timeout, you have to be perfect. And that, that would have been my one thing. <laughs> Dallas had not played perfect football that day. So to think that you were going to execute with everything on the line in a perfect manner, that, that just wasn't the day that that was going to happen. So, yeah, I just I would have liked to have seen Dak, you know, you know, get down to the ground, you know, about five yards earlier. It's not going to make or break that five yards is not going to be the difference maker. The biggest thing was the clock. And, and that's something that he's going to learn from and, and grow from and be better at moving forward. Daryl, we want to be a part of uh, uh, whatever you guys have coming up. We're getting the emails from the USFL from the media uh, outlet. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Always great to have you on the show and good luck going forward. Thank you so much. Great catching up with you guys. You too. Always good to talk to you, David. Yes, sir. You too, Daryl. Daryl Johnston, USFL Executive Vice President of Football Operations. Cowboys great. Uh, One of the most popular Cowboys players ever. I I think you, if you ask people from my era, Cowboys fans from my era, to list their favorite players, I think you might have gotten like maybe a 33% clip of Moose. Uh, I think it'd probably be more. Yeah. I I think, you know, there's triplets, obviously. That's Mm -hmm. three of the five. Mm -hmm. And then it's like a rotation of, you mentioned Moose, you mentioned Mm Novacek, you mentioned like Russell Maryland or, Mm -hmm. you know, somebody kind of a Dion. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but they, they were, I mean, they were, they were the Rams. They had yeah. all the stars. Um, uh, but yeah, Daryl's, <sighs> Daryl's definitely like a top five across the board on average, I would think, name that probably pops up on people's list. For yeah. Sure. He, he's, uh, no question. And also just uh, an unbelievable guy. And he's been in these ventures where they've gotten close and something. Again, he mentioned Vince McMahon, XFL, yeah. and COVID, and then well, also mentioned the business part of it. And Vince is worth now more than he's ever been worth because they've been cutting deals left and right because they, they took a very well renowned deal maker behind the scenes. And, you know, he's been just cutting things like they're getting involved with Disney and they're going to involve, like, I think in probably five years' time, WWE will be owned by Disney, most likely, and there'll be like theme parks and crap like that. Mm-hmm. I think that's where it's probably headed because Vince is like, his mother just died this weekend. She was like 100 plus years old, so maybe he's got another 20 years left, but he needs to stay away from football, that's for sure. Like, stay as far away from football as you possibly can because the thing with the XFL, that really was... That was not them just doing the same thing the first time. That was the pandemic, like first and foremost. Their season was starting right as the pandemic was beginning, and that just threw them for a loop right away. And then you have his business, which was at the time far more heavily dependent on live events, like the the touring, the shows that you never even see on TV that they just do five, six nights a week. Um, they stopped doing those because of the pandemic. And so mm-hmm. none, suddenly you don't have crowds. You're not making money. So, yeah, they lost a lot of money initially, and that couldn't have helped matters either. But, uh, yeah, hopefully the USFL works out. Hopefully that's not a sign of what's to come. But well, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to see another league giving it a try. We'll see how it goes. Speaking of what we just heard, is it a fire uh, uh, truck? And I know we got to go. Jordan Lewis Baylor guard joins us, Big 12 Player of the Week. Jordan, uh, excuse me, Jordan. That's the Jordan Lewis. Armstrong, do you have that that video? Chris, who's a great listener of our show on Twitter, sent me this picture. Do you have it? This is right outside our building a few minutes ago. It's a fire truck, EMS, whatever, police. And there's a, I don't know what was going on. We never felt anything. I never heard anything, never smelled any smoke. But that was interesting. And we just saw a fire truck just go blowing by here on one uh, MLK. So we're fine. We're fine. When we come back, Jordan Lewis, a triple-double in the win on Saturday. Uh, Baylor women's basketball starting to get on a run, and they better 
because Oklahoma, who beat them at home on now is Wednesday at home, and then back-to-back games in three days this weekend against Texas, Sikkim, 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Richard Carr, Buick GMC Cadillac. If you've been waiting to buy a new GMC Buick or Cadillac, well, now is the time to contact Richard Carr Motors because cars are coming, trucks are coming, and Richard Carr is receiving deliveries each week. Get on their inbound vehicle list now to get your new car or truck as they arrive, plus buy a car now and get 0% financing for 72 months for qualified buyers. If you're looking for a truck, the best truck on the road is the GMC Sierra with available 277 horsepower engine, best in class cargo bed volume, head and leg room, plus a luxury interior and ride that compares to a luxury sedan. Sierra has it all right now. Richard Carr has Sierras in stock with more on the way. And again, most trucks are at 0%. For 72 months for qualified buyers. If you're looking for an SUV, Richard Carr has 11 SUV models to choose from with dozens of trim options. They are a one stop shop to find that perfect SUV for your needs. They've got the fun and nimble Buick Encores. They've got the sophistication and luxury of Cadillac Escalades. Whatever you're looking for, Richard Carr has the SUV you need. So call now, come by now, or go online to find the perfect ride for your family. And if you're not looking to buy new, because you know, new cars and trucks are uh, pricey. Uh, well, you can get into a loaded premium pre-owned car and truck. Each one goes through a 172-point inspection before hitting the lot, and they have over 10 lenders who will do what it takes to get you in a car today. So, again, go online or come by for a test drive over at Richard Car Motors. Trust the good local people you can count on for over 20 years in Central Texas. Proud Wakelands and proud Baylor Bears. Log on to richardcar.com today or call now or go see them now off Highway 6 at the Imperial Exit. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street in Waco is a hidden gem. They've got a great selection of spirits, wine, and the most extensive selection of craft beer in Waco and their gorgeous walk-in fridge. And they have an amazing array of high-end bourbons like Pinhook, Weller, Buffalo Trace, Brush Creek, Hotel, Garrison Brothers, Thomas S. Moore, Hooten Young, and Bardstown. Great customer service and a convenient and speedy drive through window. Riverbend Liquor and Wine. Find out more on Facebook and Instagram. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Do you or your kids get nervous about going to the dentist? Stonewood Dental, Dr. Steve Childress, he can help. I've spent a career taking care of patients who as children had bad experiences and now they're adults that hate going to the dentist. If I get a kid at three years old and they come every six months and it's a happy experience, it's normal for them. Now they have an accident at six or seven or eight at school. Now they have a broken tooth or a trauma and they have to come here. They're used to lights, they're used to water in their mouth, they're used to experience, they already trust us. It's amazing what we can do with that kid without it being a negative thing. But if I see a six or seven or eight year old that's never been to the dentist, and now they have a trauma or an unfortunate, unexpected toothache, it's harder to do that for that kid and it not be somewhat of a negative experience. So bottom line is I try to teach kids and adults and teenagers their body the way I'd want my family treated, which is where it's a necessary part of life. You just take care of it. It doesn't have to be that big a deal. Learn more. Stonewood-Dental.com. Born in Waco, Brotherwell Brewing exists to serve the Central Texas community with locally crafted beer of the highest quality. They want to bring Central Texas closer to the brewing experience so everyone can enjoy well-made beer as much as they do. For two and a half years, they've been bringing high-quality beer to Central Texas at their location on Bridge Street in East Waco. Brotherwell Brewing believes in community and bringing people together to enjoy products made in their community. So for your game day, whether it's a tailgate or at home, stop by Brotherwell Brewing for high 
high quality craft beer made right here in Central Texas, 400 East Bridge Street, and check them out online at brotherwell.com. Brad Boozer, Boozer Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. I've seen people walk in there. First of all, you have so much to show. With necklaces, bracelets, rings. You have the watches. You have numerous great watches as well. You really have pretty much everything, don't you, when it comes to jewelry? That's correct. Kind of a one-stop shop and all. And the fact that we have the two jewelers on staff, the repairs we can do, the fixing of your jewelry, and the remaking of any jewelry has really set us apart from anybody else. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozers Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air in Waco. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Are you a Sikkim 365 super fan? Then try out our premium subscriptions at Sikkim365.com. Baylor guard Jordan Lewis, David Smoke, Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Jordan, thanks for your time today. What a weekend for you and also what a week ahead. Why do you feel like everything's kind of falling into place right now and it seems as if the team is playing their best basketball? Um, I think after we took those two early losses in conference play, I think we realized that the only way we were going to be able to be successful is if we all work together as one unit. And so I think in the past few games um, we've learned to – like make the extra pass. Um, we've been making open shots because we're giving the extra pass, and I think um, like the chemistry and the energy on the court has really grown. Well, you can see that, no question about it. You're coming off a spectacular game in the history of this incredible program. You're the third player ever to have a triple-double. What did that mean to you when you found that out? Um, it meant more to me as a team. Um, I've always been a team player, and I think um, some of those stats you can't get without your teammates. Like, to get 10 assists or 11 assists, you need your teammates to make shots. And so I think um, my favorite part about playing basketball as a point guard is getting my teammates open and getting them open shots because I think it really energizes our team. And so um, just as much as it's an honor for me, it was an honor for the team, and I just always try to do my part on the court. It's not that your role has changed because they need you and rely on you, but it seems like you're kind of almost in the off guard. It doesn't mean you don't run the point and you get the assist or whatever, but do you feel like maybe everybody, you're kind of now more comfortable where you are? Um, I feel like um, they've just given me the freedom to um, bring the ball up if I get a rebound, which, I mean, you saw a lot in the last game. Uh, defensive rebounding is a big part of our team. And so I think um, playing the off guard, if who, uh, it's kind of whoever's night it is. Like if you need me to play the off guard and distribute the ball more or shoot more or knock down shots, I just think um, I've just become more comfortable with um, like playing with my team as a whole in our chemistry. So knowing each other and knowing each other's tendencies, and I think it's really helped. You were named today Big 12 Player of the Week. That's a big deal. There's a lot of really good players, a lot of good players on your own team. What did that mean when you found that out? Um, I think it just is a testament to the hard work that's been put in. Um, I think while everyone's criticizing our team and maybe even my individual play for a couple of games, like I never stopped working hard and trying to continue to get better. And so I think um, while it's an honor, I just think, like you said, there's a lot of good players in this league and you can't stop with just one week and one honor. I want to go back to what you just said because I was in the post game against Iowa State when you guys blew them out, and you mentioned it, and so did Queen and even Coach Collin about maybe some of the chirping because it was a tough start and the standard of women's basketball at Baylor. How much did you guys discuss that, or did, how much did that fuel you? I don't think it was really discussed a lot because it was just known. It was there. It was out front. Um, I think we had to take it and own it. I think um, we expected more of ourselves just in general as well, and so I think – um, those people that are your biggest fans are also your biggest critics. So I think just taking it um, and using it to obviously our advantage and not letting it bring us down or wanting us to push back against people, I think we accepted it as a challenge. And I think um, each day we've grown and stood up to that challenge. So you played Saturday. Then you turn around, you have the game Wednesday, Oklahoma, then turn around with Friday, Sunday with Texas. How important and how difficult is it to, to stay off your legs and get your legs rested and, and, and maybe kind of get away, not from the game, but just have the legs fresh for when you need them? Well, I think our staff has done an incredible job of taking into consideration how many people we have on the team and how many minutes we're playing each night. And I think um, our main focus is to be locked in to what we're trying to do and not so much up and down in practice. And so I think while you still need to work hard in practice and get your legs loose, I don't think they overdo it. And so I think our staff has done like an amazing job on taking that into consideration while also keeping us focused and uh, just keeping us in shape. 
there are players on the team who have been at Baylor quite some time, been on the national championship team and all that, but you also bring kind of a maturity experience and kind of a professional type way you go about your business in many ways. How much, Jordan, was it important for you to develop relationships and also help the team get through some of the rocky times earlier? I think it's super important. As you mentioned, Baylor has pretty much been a successful program the whole time um, in the past 10 years. And so I think coming from a program that necessarily wasn't successful when I got there and leaving it more successful than I uh, when I got there, I think um, bringing that experience and bringing that you're going to have dips in your season or you may have things not go your way that you have to persevere through them. And I think building those connections off the court and on the court, like your teammates are willing to trust you and what you're saying. And so I think um, – just trying to be the leader that is always trying to be positive and find the positive and things and know that um, we can get through it together was really important to me. When you brought up some of the, the maybe the chirping about a week ago, you and Queen made a comment. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but Coach Collin kind of kind of teared up a little bit. She's a tough woman. She knows what she's doing. She's not backing down. How much have you guys supported her and stayed with her and had ta- conversations with her that you love her and that you can't wait to continue to have the success? First and foremost, just letting her know that we um, understand her and that we want to be there for her. I think um, she's gone through way more than she'll ever talk about because she's the type of person to not want her uh, things that are going on with her reflect on our team or bother our team or anything like that. So I think she's very strong in that manner. Um, I think we really tried to play hard for her, not only for ourselves but for her because we know what she goes through day in and day out. But she's willing to put herself in front of us and battle, go to battle with us any day. And so I think um, just loving her and showing her the support and just telling her how much like we appreciate her being here and taking on the role is um, something that we try to do as often as we can. How difficult was it? to have struggles and then also battle COVID? Was it almost like a boulder on your shoulder? I feel like it was tough to go into COVID with the loss on our shoulders that everyone criticized. Um, I think just sitting there day after day after day thinking that you went in with the loss and now you're missing games and you're just waiting for the opportunity to get back on the court. So I think while it was tough, it was also a lesson. And I think um, while COVID, we don't want to say it's a good thing, I think it might be what happened to our team that was able to turn our season around so fast. And so I think... Um, we just had to stay positive, and we had to take everything that we could out of it and just make the best of it. When I've spoken to your mom and dad, and I saw your dad at the game against Iowa State, and they travel, going to be in town this week, and I know that it's hard for them because of where they live, but they love you and want to be around with you, and you play great when they're there, and you play well even when they're not. But how much of an influence have they had? I feel like my mom is more off the court. She um, really holds me accountable to be a good person just in general as a human being. And I think my dad has that competitive side that brings that energy. He's always challenging me. Um, I think I'm the hardest person on myself, but he's a close second. Um, He's always there to support me, but he's also not going to let me do anything that he thinks is not what I can do. And so I think um, having them as parents has really, like, made me who I am today. And I think um, having a mix of the love and uh, also support, but also the challenging side to them has really um, made it what it is. You had to show some toughness yourself and resiliency when you transferred in, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of that, right after that, there's the coaching change. You have a fire that obviously burns pretty deep that you wanted to stay here and help this program get through the transition and be great. Where does that come from? I've always been a person that believes in people who want to give you the best. I think even when I talked to Coach Collin for the first time, uh, she made it known that she wanted me here, and she made it known that she could help me with my future. So I think that was a big part of it. And also um, just watching Baylor and knowing some of the players on the team, like they were a competitive group. They know how to win. And I feel like this was the right group to come play with. I feel like I fit in with them with my playing style, and I feel like I could help them get better and they could help me get better. So I think um, I was willing to take the challenge on. I don't think I'm ever a person to run away from challenges. So I think it was just a perfect opportunity for me. Big week, Oklahoma, Texas twice. This is This is maybe as good as it gets. Yes, this is going to be a big week for us, but I don't think we can look ahead to the end of the week before we start. I think it all starts today in practice. So, All right, get some rest, get some practice. Thanks for your time. Congratulations on the All-Big 12 Player of the Week. Jordan Lewis, the third Baylor player ever with a triple-double. Sick on 365 Radio and 365 Sports.
From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible challenge. Hi, this is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like First Free Checking, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. The First National Bank of Central Texas. Familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC. Equal housing lender. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. It's pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy and, you know, I bring my kids and my kids love being here too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> Staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home, it's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here, and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more, stonewood-dental.com. It takes time to reach goals. It's a truth that applies to more than sports. It goes for your financial goals as well. You work hard for your money, and you deserve an investment strategy that lines up with your game plan. And Tom Albers, your Edward Jones financial advisor, can help. If your financial investments aren't putting forth the effort you desire, stop by today for a financial review. Tom Albers, 4301 Lakeshore Drive, 254-776-7605. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Brad Boozer, Boozer Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. Brad, what makes you different than anyone else, in your opinion, as far as what Boozer's does? The fact that I own the jewelry store, anything I need to do, will do, or can do, I can do it. The buck stops with me, whereas a lot of places you have to go up the corporate command and corporate channel. Well, if you come in and want to make a deal, we sit there and we make the deal. And you can find whatever someone's looking for, correct? Anything is obtainable. I don't care what brand it is, what size it is, how much it costs, large or small. Anything is obtainable, and we can definitely get that in for you to see, look at, or buy. Do you have the opportunity if people have to pay things off as far as a layaway program? What about what you have with financing? Absolutely. We have 12 months, no interest financing. We have layaway. If you want to pay with Bitcoin, I can take Bitcoin now. So okay. if there's any, any way you want to pay for it, we can find a way out to make it work. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozer's Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air in Waco. Baylor University is where lights shine bright. So let there be light. Let there be roommates and teammates, scholarship and championships. Let there be fresh starts and new traditions, fast friendships and lasting impacts. Let there be laughter. Let there be joy. Let there be light. Baylor University, where lights shine bright. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injuries, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trust. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, wants to get you back in the game. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Looking that way is Prescott throwing that way, and that's going to be caught for the touchdown by Amari Cooper. It's time for our weekly segment with David Hellman of DallasCowboys.com. All right, here we go, 5 o'clock hour. David Hellman, DallasCowboys.com. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, I'm David Smoke, and here we go, uh, on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. So, David Hellman, man, I tell you what, what the Bengals have done and how they've done it, of course, Burrow and Chase or whatever, compared to the Rams who have... There he is, he's back now. Okay. Uh, the, the Rams have gone out and acquired talent to make a run for it. Do you think that's going to like test Jerry's patience? 
Well, let me hit this again. Oops. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah now we can. Now. I'm sorry, David. No, you're fine. No worries. Um, no, not really, to be honest with you. I mean, the Cowboys have pretty firmly established the way that they do things in the offseason for better and for worse. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot to me that suggests that they're going to drastically overhaul the way they do it. I think it, this is always a fun time of year where you look at the way the teams that are in the Super Bowl have done it. And yeah, I think the Rams are, are kind of working a market inefficiency right now. They're one of the few teams uh, that seems willing to part with big time draft capital. I'm interested to see how that pans out. I mean, if they win this game, then it'll all have been worth it. Um, but I don't think it's going to drastically alter the way the Cowboys approach things. Well, and it's it's been done either way on either side. So, and the Cowboys have done it both ways, and it's still been a long time. So, you know, I, there's probably not a way in the middle that they could do it uh, and make it work because they've probably done that too, haven't they? See, that's – I would love to see the Cowboys try to find a middle ground because I, I do think that they skew much more conservatively than – a lot of teams and, and, and to, to be perfectly honest with you like it sounds terrifying to mortgage two and three years worth of big time draft picks on one roster I mean there's just too much stuff that can go wrong when you only play one game I mean uh, and and I get it it didn't happen but uh, if Jaquiski Tart holds on to an easy interception late in the fourth quarter of that game San Francisco probably wins and we're sitting here talking about how the Rams went all in and it didn't work out. So, like I said, it worked out. I get that. You can't revise history, but you just leave too much stuff up to chance in a game like football where you only get one crack at it for me to want to mortgage that much of my draft capital. But I do think the Cowboys could do a better job of, of being moderately aggressive. Um, you know, you don't have to swing for a grand slam every time, but the Cowboys typically don't even step into the batter's box in situations like that. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that they could stand to be a little bit more aggressive without going completely overboard. David, it's no secret you're an LSU fan, and I would imagine a lot of LSU fans had high hopes for Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, but I can't imagine even the the biggest LSU homers could have thought that they'd have the Bengals in a Super Bowl this quickly. Uh, just your thoughts from that standpoint of seeing these two, and, and you know, there's others involved as well, but Burrow and Chase uh, just working their magic again. Yeah, I think I think Joe said it himself yesterday after the game. He was like, if you had told me in the preseason that we were going to make it to the Super Bowl, even I would have thought you were crazy, but nothing surprises me now. Um I mean, I, I had all the confidence in the world that Joe was going to live up to the to his draft status. But yeah, to do it in two seasons, and I mean, the the problems with that roster were well documented, and and they even showed up in the playoffs. Like for him to get sacked, whatever it was, like thirteen times in three games, and they still found a way to win all of them. Uh, it's it's incredible, man. He's he's a special guy, and uh, I know it's. It, it's probably frustrating for Cowboy fans to see that work out for a team that was – and they had the number one pick with Joe, and then they were in the top five again this year. So, I mean, I think I saw they had the worst two-year record of any team that has made it to the Super Bowl. Like I said, I, I'm sure that's frustrating for Cowboy fans, but what a what a cool moment for, for Cincy fans. I mean, maybe not the longest-suffering franchise in the league, but – but definitely in the top five or six, you know. I mean, that's a that's a fan base that's been waiting for something good to happen since the late '80s. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm pumped for Joe. I'm pumped for them. That was freaking cool. It's a great story. So the Oilers slash Texans, the Oilers now the Titans. They got in, but the the Texans who are still kind of a young franchise, Detroit, Cleveland, mm -hmm. and then guess who's right behind them? Yeah, Washington, Washington and Dallas. Just coming right up behind them as the longest droughts. Now that Cincinnati's yeah. made it, no, the uh, I mean it's it's a brutal truth. It's probably it's hard for Cowboys people to hear, probably. But I, I say it all the time. You know, it's it's kind of and and to be fair, I mean the Cowboys have been competitive for most of the last twenty five years. But when you talk about getting to the game, it's easy for people to you know you, you get in these conversations. And it's like well thank God we're not the Jags or thank God we're not this team or that team. And it's like, man, you're, 
at this point, you're keeping company with those types of franchises. And yeah, I mean, Cincinnati making it to a Super Bowl only further emphasizes that. I think, the, yeah, the only franchises in the NFC that haven't been to multiple conference title games since 1995 are Detroit, Washington, and Dallas. I mean, everybody else has been to two or more uh, while those three are still looking for their first one in a long, long time. So, yeah, there's there's no way around it. This is this is as long as I've covered the Cowboys, this is a frustrating time of year because you're seeing what other teams are doing to get over that hump and the Cowboys haven't been able to. I, I think one of the things that just keeps running through my head is Mike Brown is an owner who famously does not care as much as the other owners. I don't know if care, care but like he is not on the same level of invested in the day to day or some of those things like the other guys are. And Jerry Jones, for whatever people want to say about him, David, and you know this from working there, that dude cares. Like, that's what he wants. He knows, even when they say, like, all he cares about is money, he also knows that the the maximum value of his franchise is that of a team that wins Super Bowls. So even if it's that, he super cares. And then you see a guy like Mike Brown, who's who's aloof compared to Jerry, and he his team's in it. Yeah, like I said, it's it's a frustrating time of year, and and it hasn't. I mean, it's not just the Bengals. Like in the time that I've done this, I mean, I know they didn't sustain it, but the Jaguars had a run like this. Uh, you've seen a lot of teams kind of rise up and and at least have this one type of special moment. I mean, I think you're right. Mike Brown gets a reputation as being aloof, but the front office that he's put underneath him, uh, Duke Tobin is the guy that kind of runs their personnel department. They've done a fantastic job. I mean, they, obviously, you know, you get a shot, you get a shot at the number one overall pick and you draft this special charismatic player like Joe Burrow. That obviously counts for a lot, but what they did with their defense in one off season says just as much. I mean, they signed uh, Trey Hendrickson from the saints who a lot of people, we're worried about him being able to replicate his success. He had 14 sacks for the Bengals this year. Our guy, Cheeto Wuzie, who good, good player for the Cowboys, not ever like a great player. Uh, he goes up there and had a fantastic season. Uh, they've had some draft picks hit in addition to Joe and Chase. Um, it's just kind of a, it's kind of a perfect storm. So credit, credit Mike Brown for putting quality people in place and letting them do their thing. And, that's again. That's what makes it frustrating. Is I, th- I think for the most part, the Cowboys have done a pretty good job at that type of stuff. I mean, they draft as well as anybody in the NFL, and they've been up to the playoffs on a pretty regular basis over the last ten, fifteen years. They just, for whatever reason, haven't been able to kind of catch that lightning in a bottle. And look, maybe I'm a homer. Maybe I'm too close to the team. Like. I didn't watch, other than maybe the Bills-Chiefs game, which is just like one of the most insane football games I've ever seen. Um, Yep. I didn't watch any – y'all correct me if you think I'm wrong. Like, I didn't watch any other playoff football this month and be like, yep, these teams look like they're way out of Dallas's league. Like, Dallas doesn't belong on the same field with these guys. I I did not get that impression watching San Francisco play L.A. yesterday. Those That looked like two teams trying to give the game away in the fourth quarter to me. Um. And that's, again, that's not to, like, overhype the Cowboys. They have plenty of their own problems. They lost in the first round for a reason. But I didn't look at most of what happened in the playoffs and think that the Cowboys are a far cry from competing on that level. And that's, that, that makes it even more frustrating because it's hard to pinpoint why exactly they're not able of achieving more. I know this happened a couple of, or I guess more than a couple of days ago at this point, but since we last talked to you, Dan Quinn, in fact, staying in Dallas, David, uh, that's obviously huge news, but uh, were you surprised by that in any way? And just your thoughts on him making that decision? I was very surprised. I mean, I think he was a candidate for every opening there was. Yeah. And he was a, he was a finalist for at least two. So anytime that many jobs want to take a crack at you. You just assume something's going to come up, but I think it was a combination of, of Dan Quinn knowing the situation that he's in. The Cowboys have persuasive powers, all their own. I mean, Jerry Jones basically alluded to the fact that, that he thought Dan Quinn was going to wind up a head coach before they kind of sat down together and worked it out that he was going to stay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
And he, he mentioned it as well. They've done that before with other guys. They did it with Kellen Moore last year to keep him from leaving for Boise State. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a steal. Obviously, you look at everything that Dan Quinn did for this defense. Now, the funny thing, like, he's going to have to do it again. I mean, you got several key players headed for free agency. Randy Gregory, J. Ron Kirst. Honestly, all of their safeties are slated for free agency right now. you got to figure out what to do about your other linebackers not named Micah Parsons. Um, there's plenty There's plenty of work to do. And going back to what we were just talking about, like the Cowboys are very likely not going to be super aggressive. Like They're probably going to try to hang on to a couple of their own guys one way or another and then sign bargain guys who they hope to develop. I mean, that's what J. Ron Curse was, and it's probably – the best job of doing that that they've done in the last decade of like turning a bargain, a bargain signing into like a pro bowl caliber player. Um, But can you do it two years in a row? I don't know, but Dan Quinn's probably going to have to. Um, So I I think it's nice that, you know, the scheme stays in place. The coaching stays in place. I think continuity, continuity should help. But um, I think, I think they're going to have their work cut out for them again. Um, I don't know how much carries over from this success. I think they're going to have to start back at the bottom mountain all over again. You know, watching them, and they are loaded up with a lot of the bells and whistles, and, and they have two Hall of Famers on the offensive line, and obviously Demarcus Lawrence is very good, and they have a lot of guys that I think outplayed who they were either drafted, undrafted, or signed. It, it, it's not as if – when you watch San Francisco and the Rams, you see two teams that are like – beating the hell out of each other, even though they're not doing it all well sometimes. And we saw a little bit of that early with San Francisco punching Dallas in the mouth. It can't be a grit factor, can it? Because that would be like embarrassing to even admit because every NFL team plays physical. Is is there anything to that at all? I do think I think the Cowboys offensive line has a lot of a lot of work in front of it this offseason. And that that's the big thing for me, because I mean other than and, and that was kind of a Dan Quinn tendency. The defense against San Francisco, they kind of got it taken to them for the first eight to ten minutes of that game, and they completely had it together by the second quarter. I mean, they gave up what thirteen points in the first quarter and a half of that game, and only allowed ten the rest of the way. I mean, the defense more than did its job, and I felt like that was a theme throughout the year. I mean, you hold the Chiefs to nineteen, you hold the Cardinals. 25 you hold the 49ers to 23 given everything that's be enough to win those games you should beat kansas city if you hold them to 19 points i mean that's crazy um but the dallas offensive line for sure i mean the the, that was the identity of this team for so many years and the blunt truth of the matter is just not the case anymore i mean they got they got whipped by san francisco they got whipped by a lot of good teams kansas city being another one um, and there's something to be said again, Joe Burrow proved that you don't necessarily need amazing pass protection to win those types of games, but it sure does help if you can set the tone and run the ball and protect your quarterback and kind of wear the other guys down. I thought, you know, San Francisco's offensive line is, is fantastic. They bullied the Cowboys and the Rams made them look vulnerable. I mean, obviously when you've got Aaron Donald and Von Miller and Leonard Floyd, I guess that's to be expected, but well, I mean, I don't think San Francisco ran for more than like 60 yards as a team yesterday. Um, so yeah, again, the importance of having an offensive line that can dominate the line of scrimmage and dictate the, the pace of the game. I don't think the Cowboys have had that on a regular basis in a while. And for me, in terms of like getting this team over that hump, I think that is the clearest and most obvious fix you can make this off is, is to upgrade that, that, that line. So, David, uh, have you got your bags packed for Mobile, Alabama? You guys are headed to the Senior Bowl. Is that right? I am in Mobile, Alabama right now, oh, nice. as a matter of fact. I got here this afternoon. So, yeah, we'll be we'll be at the practices. We'll be keeping an eye on the prospects. And uh, I think Jerry and Steven are here as well. So, maybe we'll have a little bit of front office news, too. Maybe try to figure out what's going on with Callum Moore. But, yeah, it should be should be a pretty eventful week down here. I'm looking forward to it. Where are you in draft prep? Are you, like, at the very beginning stage, or have you already started to kind of dip into that a little bit? I, I would I would call it, like, dipping our toes in the water. I mean, you know, my buddy brought us, and some of our draft guys have already watched 
50, 60 players. <laughs> I have not gotten that far, but uh, the Senior Bowl is kind of a great jumping off point because you can go and watch these practices and say, holy crap, who's that guy that just keeps burning everybody? Or who's that guy that picked the quarterback off like five reps in a row? And so, you you know, you jot those names down and you watch these practices and you say like, okay, these are these are the dozen like best senior players in this draft. And then you mix that with all of the underclassmen that you know are going to be first round picks. And like I said, that kind of gives you a nice jumping off point. So hopefully by the time I fly home on Thursday, I'll know a lot more than I do right now. David, thank you. Appreciate your time as always. David Hellman, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, guys. DallasCowboys.com in Mobile, Senior Bowl. And I, I've seen some videos of the various games or practices that are going on. There's two different ones. I saw one with Xavier Newman. Uh, and uh, is it Xavier Newman Johnson? Yeah, and that wouldn't be the Senior Bowl. That, that was the be, other one. Yeah. And then I saw Tyquan Thornton Which is battling the other one. With, uh, the, with defensive backs and, and showing up. And, and doing pretty well. Clay Johnston is in the Super Bowl, former Baylor linebacker with Cincinnati, was with Carolina. Matt Rule brought him there. His dad's still a part of that organization, and then all of a sudden Clay's no longer a part of Carolina. Not a bad deal. Go from a team that really is struggling to a Super Bowl. And hey. had no idea when he got picked up by Cincinnati that they were on their way to the Super yeah. Bowl. Like, had no clue. He just was probably happy to have a job, and he lasted on waivers less than 24 hours. And I'm sure that's the downside to your college coach picking you in the NFL is he might have to cut you in eventually. Yeah. Uh, but the good news for Clay was whatever that conversation was like with Rule, um, 24 hours later he was on the Bengals roster. And not only has he not been a guy that's just sat on the practice squad or just sat to the side, he's actually played. You know, special teams, he made a big two-point conversion stop on Derrick Henry in the wild card round. And um, had a tackle yesterday so he's actually out there and you know playing a little bit which is great and yeah he will be the lone representative uh, for Baylor in the Super Bowl almost had Jermichael Hasey in there yep. if the 49ers could have done the job and you saw him out there a lot he wasn't getting carries but he was you know running passing routes out of the backfield he kick was blocking returns, kick, kick returns yeah. that kind of jazz he's going to be a free agent exclusive rights free agent now so we'll see what happens with Jermichael in San Francisco and then I mean the Chiefs you saw Mark Vidal you saw Mark Vidal if you were watching the game his look of whatever like disbelief shock disgust uh, what have you um, for the Chiefs to, to lose that game was just unbelievable the way the game started. But, yeah, there was Mark Vidal, um, you know, with a chance to go to the Super Bowl, so to speak. And uh, I guess all, uh, Andrew Billings as well on the practice squad, and, and that was not to be the case. Uh, I'll uh, tell for, you, though, I, I have to compliment Mark Vidal on one thing. If you're going to be the tight end, um, you know, do the smart thing and follow the tight end around wherever he is in the sideline. So when Travis Kelsey is over there, and that's what we got to see. Around. Just follow him around. Oh, yeah. You're next to Travis Kelsey all the time. Uh, yeah, no, and there was that picture at a very bad time because Kansas City was done. You could see where he where they were taking a – they were shooting. Who was it behind him? Who was it behind him? It wasn't Kelsey. Kelsey. It was okay. yeah, Kelsey. I'm sorry. And then there's Vital. Had a, Jennifer even uh, – Dad, what? Vital? Yeah, Chiefs? she didn't know. No, and I had She's to like, tell what's her. What's he doing? I was like, well, of, he's on the Chiefs and – but why is he playing football? <laughs> and I was like, well, because he did that like a year he's ago. Because he's a six three and a half yeah. power forward, and there's well, not and really. Well, Baylor's had a little bit of that, yeah, you know. But there's not there's not room for him no. in in professional basketball really with his skill set. But being a bull in a china shop who's super athletic and can get from side to side really quickly uh, I, means I, you can maybe be an NFL player. Yeah. I'm just glad you brought that up. I'm glad you. Brought I don't up. know what it is either, though. Like where. NFL teams have some interest in Baylor basketball players. I mean, from him and, and Rico Gathers uh, and, and Ish Wainwright. And Ish Wainwright. Like, I mean, to have three basketball players who did not play any football, even though Ish Wainwright played one year, that first rule year. But outside of that, those three guys played zero football in college. And all three of them signed NFL deals. And they may or may not have seen any time. Like, Rico was very hit or miss. And the other two have been as well. But. That's still remarkable. Like, that's crazy. They've had three basketball players sign NFL deals for just no reason, because really. Because of how I mean, they play. Yeah. I think because of Charlie Melton, the strength and conditioning. Yeah. And I think last year's mauling of Gonzaga, you know, you heard a lot of guys talking about grown-ass men against Gonzaga. Uh, speaking of Ish Wainwright, last night played 20 minutes and a Suns win against the Spurs, had a career-high 10 points 
and they uh, they interviewed him after the game. He got a big hug from Chris Paul. Uh, it was a great moment for Ish, who had been in Europe and all over the place. Uh, and then Armstrong, the graphic about the NFL Conference Championship and college programs represented. This is from the two games that were being played yesterday. LSU and Oklahoma had nine players each in that game. Florida had eight. Georgia and Michigan had seven. Six, Iowa and Ohio State. Five, Alabama, Clemson, and who am I missing? NC State. Four, Paul, Florida State, Oregon, Penn State, Carolina, South Carolina. A&M. Utah. Utah. Washington. Three is a list including Brigham Young, Cincinnati, and Texas. Two players, Baylor's on that list, along with K-State, TCU, West Virginia, and all the other logos you see that are listed. Arkansas, Missouri, right there in the top left. TCU player with the big interception. Traven Howard. Yeah, to end that game. He played at Longview High School, intercepted the pass for the Rams, was at TCU, a hell of a player in high school and college, and he, of course, uh, helped end the game. For San Francisco or for the Rams against Trent Williams and Jermichael Hasty, who played for the 49ers. I have two questions for you guys just based off yesterday, and I could probably ask a lot more. But okay. uh, uh, for one, uh, did y'all think the game was over when the Chiefs went up early? Oh, yeah. 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 I, I just kept remembering how they were 18 points up in the first game. I think Nance kept alluding to that. I was like, oh, you never know. But I just thought they, they were going to score 35 points. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and Twitter certainly did. I was following along a little bit uh, with, with what people were commenting. And, you know, that game it, it looked like it was going to get out of hand, I mean, potentially. And, and credit to uh, to Cincinnati. Also, I know he's dinged up, and that's going to be part of the storyline. It's like, oh, well, he was he's not 100%. But what are your thoughts on Jimmy Garoppolo? He is – look, if I was trying to – I think he's going to be the perfect bus driver, bridge that gap quarterback. He's gotten a team to a Super Bowl. He's gotten a team to a conference championship game. So he's good enough to do that if you build the system around what his strengths are. And so he's running that zone scheme with Kyle Shanahan. But when it comes down to that point in the game where it's like you got to have your quarterback make a play, that's where I'm kind of out on Jimmy G. And he okay. looks like he's going to pee his pants in nervousness yeah. okay. sometimes. I, yeah. I, I, and I'm gonna, I, I don't think he's someone that you would like – build a franchise around he is a a, a player two away from taking a team to a super bowl twice so i yeah. know that means he you know again i know there's the trent dilfers and the mark rippins mark rippin was an mvp that year and and, and hostetler and whoever else i'm missing flacco you know what though there are times when i watched his he throws the ball really really well he's not like he's not gifted well he's not in this position because he's untalented like i mean that's the thing the patriots basically groomed him behind brady for years and you know then san francisco was like yeah well, this will be our franchise quarterback but i just feel like they've got to make a, a move he's I not a top 10 or 15 he's holding them back i feel like well, in, in a way and there's um, a chance that lance uh, trey lance, trey lance. Is at, yeah he's probably it's his he start his clock starts running I'm, yeah i was pretty just pretty quickly i was curious just because it seems like it doesn't really seem like people are split on jimmy g i think most people feel like jimmy g's maybe the biggest thing holding San Francisco back. But there's also a lot of people that do respect his game. I, he's just somewhere in the middle for me of just, he's not the guy, clearly. I think and he's, he's also not terrible. I, I think he's better than probably, what, Paul, 10 or 12 quarterbacks in the NFL, maybe yeah, even I mean, like 15. He's, about he's the, a gritty yeah. little dude, man. He's yeah, solidly he in the middle. Look, if you are in a point where you can't, you you miss out on drafting a quarterback and you don't trade for a big-time veteran, so say Aaron Rodgers is really on the block or Russell Wilson's really on the block and they really do get traded and you were one of the teams who were hoping you get them and you don't get them and you have a weird draft position you don't get the quarterback that you want if you need somebody to keep you in playoff contention for a year or two before you do make your move to, to me jimmy g's that guy he's gonna throw yeah. a ball like he did against dallas and yeah. almost flipped the squ script he uh, also the well, one flipped who, the script last yeah, night well, you know i mean yeah. where it's in the game he's getting desperate but i mean it's gonna be fourth and yeah. 30 although you know you can get a defensive penalty and get an automatic That's first down but bad that, decision, though. yeah the, well but we saw in Burrow last got week lucky. we saw somebody yeah. throw a terrible ball you know, we who's the guy that threw the ball in the end zone uh, last week in the playoffs, he threw up, kind of tried to. Oh no, it was two weeks ago. It was Kyler Murray? Yeah. When he just like Kyler Murray, who's who would you know you'd like to have? Hey, one note: uh, UT, a twenty million dollar donation from Tito's. They will help uh, towards the uh, enhancement of various athletic facilities. Twenty million dollar investment. 
from uh, Tito's. Uh, future news. Tito's is no longer available in College Station, Texas. <laughs> yeah, you wonder about yeah, You'll be that. drinking Smirnoff for the rest of your life, uh, College and, and Station. And now, I'm also not smart enough with both of you guys. <laughs> yeah. are all, Dripping Springs, maybe. I, I, I can't keep up with this. I haven't tried it. I'm too confused. Wordle has been sold by the original guy who d developed the game Wordle. Yeah, Josh I mean, Wardle, I guess it is. There's not really yeah. anything to really break down. I mean, the guy started an app and it became popular and he sold it to the New York Times yeah. <laughs> like two weeks after it what got popular. What actually is it? I know it's like, it's it looks like... It's a word game. Okay. It's Wordle. It's, it's a basically they give you a set number of letters and you have to figure out what the word is okay. that those letters make up. Okay. And people like Armstrong have gotten really into it. I've played it. It's, it's not something I've gotten addicted to by any means. I probably won't play it much once the New York Times officially takes over just because it... it Typically, things like that just become less interesting or not as good after that. But, uh, yeah, I know, like, Armstrong plays it a lot. I see it on my timeline all the time of yeah, people posting the word of the up. day. And that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's what it is. So, I don't know. It felt like it got really popular, like, a couple weeks ago. And already it's being bought by the New York Times. So, kudos to they that. They bought app. The Athletic. They now bought that. Yeah. Yeah. They're acquiring I, everything. I still but, don't understand how they have money. Yeah, I mean, they're not good at what they do. And what they, the hey, New York Times should be really good at what they do. They're not anymore, and we, they just have more money. We didn't have time. I'm going to hand this over to Craig for Off the Radar, Grambling State University, and an NIL deal. Craig, I'll let you handle that. And also news about uh, Otani as well when it comes to uh, games or whatever. Uh, when we come back, Ross Tucker. He's uh, the Ross Tucker podcast, former NFL offensive lineman. He's also a part of CBS Sports. He was on the sideline of the game with Kansas City and Cincinnati on Sunday. He joins us to discuss the uh, Super Bowl and the games and also what happened over the weekend and Tom Brady's retirement. Sikkim, 365 Radio and 365 Sports. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Nitchi Group Insurance Agency. With the Nitchi Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Nitchi Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Nitchi Group at 1-800-258-8302. It's plain and simple. Waco Custom Marketplace is the one-stop shop for what you need for tailgating from charcoal, cold beer, and wine. And, of course, customize your order with brisket, tri-tips, sausage, wings, smoked pork tenderloin, country-style or pork spare ribs, marinated beef and chicken fajita meat, ground beef and chili, meat, hot dogs, and burgers, buns, seasoning, sauces, chips. There's fresh-baked bread and kolaches every day, breakfast sausage links, and you can also customize your favorite favorite cut of steaks from select choice or prime bacon wrap fillets ribeyes new york strip sirloin t-bone and porterhouse full service butcher shop includes pork poultry beef chicken and seafood serving waco restaurants and families since 1940 your one-stop shop for beef pork poultry and seafood needs waco custom marketplace 425 lake air drive or waco custom marketplace.com Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street in Waco is a hidden gem. They've got a great selection of spirits, wine, and the most extensive selection of craft beer in Waco and their gorgeous walk-in fridge. And they have an amazing array of high-end bourbons like Pinhook, Weller, Buffalo Trace, Brush Creek, Hotel, Garrison Brothers, Thomas S. Moore, Hooten Young, and Bardstown. Great customer service and a convenient and speedy drive through window. Riverbend Liquor and Wine. Find out more on Facebook and Instagram. You know what would make this moment better? Pizza. Dough made from scratch and an Italian family sauce recipe pizza. Three fresh signature cheeses making a melty blanket of perfect pizza. Bob Mock has owned Marco's Pizza franchises since 2013 and has been delivering pizza since 2001 and is the proud owner of four locations in the Waco area in Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and soon to be open in Robinson. Order at Marco's.com to make any moment better. Marcos, pizza lovers get it. Uh -huh. 
It's plain and simple. Waco Custom Marketplace is the one-stop shop for what you need for tailgating from charcoal, cold beer, and wine. And, of course, customize your order with brisket, tri-tip, sausage, wings, smoked pork tenderloin, country style or pork spare ribs, marinated beef and chicken fajita meat, ground beef and chili, meat, hot dogs, and burgers, buns, seasoning, sauces, chips. There's fresh baked bread and kolaches every day, breakfast sausage links, and you can also customize your favorite cut of steaks from select choice or prime bacon wrap fillets ribeyes new york strips sirloin t-bone and porterhouse full service butcher shop includes pork poultry beef chicken and seafood serving waco restaurants and families since 1940 your one-stop shop for beef pork poultry and seafood needs waco custom marketplace 425 lake air drive or waco custom marketplace.com Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. There it is to the end zone, and he comes down with it. Outrageous. What a catch. Chase 101. Forget about it. The 5 o'clock hour is sponsored by Edward Jones Investments with financial advisor Tom Albers. Staying in touch with you and your money through these difficult and changing times. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. We're now joined by Ross Tucker, CBS Sports, MyFrontPageStory.com, and the Ross Tucker Podcast on Sikkim 365 Radio, Paul Catalina and David Smoke. Ross, uh, how about the Cincinnati Bengals? My goodness, what a run they've made with Joe Burrow and company, and how surprised were you with some of the mismanagement uh, that Kansas City had in key moments yesterday? Very, very. Yep, I mean, I, I was there on the sideline, and I, I thought the game was going to get away from the Bengals. 21-3. Mahomes scores touchdowns the first three drives. I thought, oh boy, this is going to be one of those kind of games. The Bengals had a nice season, nice story, but now they, they're not putting their big boy pants on against the Chiefs. I'm telling you guys, because I was there, the last play of the first half changed everything. Everything. I was on the – first of all, a couple of people that were on the Chiefs sideline told me that Andy Reid wanted to kick the field goal with five seconds left. And Mahomes said, one more. No, just one more play. Quick, quick, one more play. It's almost like Mahomes, though, didn't know the situation. You can't throw the ball in the flat in that situation. Andy Reid trusted his player, and that trust was not rewarded because Mahomes clearly didn't have the, the football IQ to know what to do in that situation. It's a quick throw in the end zone or throw it out of bounds or in the dirt. you got to get the field goal there. And when he threw it in the flat and Tyree Kill got tackled, I was on the Bengals' sideline, and they went nuts. I was with Zach Taylor as he was talking to Evan Washburn, the Bengals' head coach, talking to the CBS sideline guy, and he was so fired up. He was like, the same score we had last time when we beat these guys. You know, it's a huge stop for us. Like, he was fired up. That, that stop gave the Bengals all the momentum and belief that they needed. Ross, uh, this kind of felt the Bengals like a team that was a year away to me. When you watch in the regular season, like, man, that, you know, Burrow and, and Chase, I mean, had a hit on those picks <laughs> right away. But, you know, they still needed some functional things. Their offensive line still isn't isn't fantastic, as you know. But what what enabled them to put it together to not be a year away anymore? Honestly, I think the biggest thing is probably just Burrow. Um, I interviewed him after the game. It's crazy how calm, cool, and collected that guy is. I mean, probably like the calmest guy I think I've ever interviewed. I mean, I was only allowed to have three questions with him. He was so relaxed when I asked him the first one. I said, Joe, you just won the AFC championship game. You're going to the Super Bowl. Why are you so calm right now? And he's like, I was excited right after the game, but you know, uh, this is kind of what I thought would happen. Like he really believes that the Bengals are supposed to be winning these games. And that's, I think why they are he, everything that's happening. You get the sense that Joe Burrow more or less 
This is what he knows. This is, what, this is how he thought it would go down. You know, it's interesting. You see these young quarterbacks, and I know Mahomes made the mistake and didn't finish it off, but you have uh, Burrow, among others now, as on the same weekend in which, or well, a week from Aaron Rodgers is out, and now the story about Tom Brady, whenever that becomes official. The NFL's in pretty good hands, isn't it, Ross? There it is. There are some young guys that can really, really play. I mean, think about what we saw last Sunday night with Mahomes and Josh Allen. And now think about Joe Burrow and what he's able to do. It's very exciting. Very exciting. And it seems like a lot of them are in the AFC. So Aaron Rodgers, you better think about what he wants to do. I don't know if you want to go to the AFC if you're Aaron Rodgers. I mean, NFC seems like a better place to be. Uh, to the NFC now, Matt Stafford in the Super Bowl after years of uh, chewing away with the Lions. And, you know, the, the Lions uh, kind of always seem like they, they get something they like, like Matt Stafford. They, well, that's it. We had Barry Sanders. That's it. We got Matt Stafford and, and Megatron. That's it. That's all we really need. And does it, they kind of stop, it feels like, and they don't really know what they're doing. How much um, is it Matt Stafford being with the Rams? How much did he bring there? And how much did that marriage really work i'm so happy for him i mean aren't you guys I, i'm so happy for that guy like you know it's tough to overcome you know it's interesting matthew stafford was not able to do what joe burrow did matthew stafford was not able to turn around a franchise like joe burrow did I hadn't thought of that till right now talking with you guys. I'm happy for him, but think about this. If Jaquaski Tart intercepts that pass, mm -hmm. which was a horrific pass by Stafford, we're all singing a different tune today. You know, I mean, then it's like, oh my gosh, Stafford just threw the ball up in the middle of the air for no reason. What is he doing? It, it really is remarkable to think about how much of a difference just that one play would have made. Maybe they still would have won. You know, who knows? But it's uh, it's pretty remarkable when you think about it. I'm happy for Stafford. I think he deserves this. And also, going back to the Aaron Rodgers conversation, two years ago, Brady went to the Bucks. They went all in. They won the Super Bowl. This year, Matthew Stafford went to the Rams. They went all in. Von Miller, Odell Beckham Jr., Super Bowl. Man, that's a, that's that's pretty good truth serum right there. Uh, again, Ross Tucker, the Ross Tucker Podcast, CBS Sports, and also Valentine's coming up. Ross, myfrontpagestory.com. This is something that that you started recently and uh, in the last year or two, and we've had you on before to talk about it. This is to me one of the most unique ways to celebrate Valentine's Day. Well, you of all people, Dave, would love it because there's nothing else like it. Uh, we have a bunch of writers on staff. It's so cool to see the videos of these guys when they get it for their wives for Valentine's Day. You hand your wife this big package, right? And she's like, what is this? She starts to open it. She's confused. And you're like, honey, I want to do something special for you this year. I had a story written about you. She will be so confused. She's like, wait, what? What do you mean you had a story written about me? Yeah, I had a story written about you. And when she sees it, it's beautiful. It looks like it's on the cover of the newspaper, framed pictures of her and the family right in the middle of it. it looks like just like a newspaper. And then when she actually reads it, and it's like, I just never tell her enough how much I appreciate all the little things she does for the family. Like, I'm telling you guys, she will cry. If you get it for your wife for Valentine's Day, myfrontpagestory.com, she will cry happy tears. You will win. I can almost guarantee it. Myfrontpagestory.com. Guaranteed win. That's a guarantee. That's, yeah, a, that's, that's a Namath thing right there. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Ross Tucker going Namath for Valentine's Day. All right, Ross, uh, real quick before we got to let you go. Early, we got two weeks before the Super Bowl hits. Do you, do, you have, do you have a prediction on this? I mean, especially after you talked to Joe Burrow yesterday, did that, did that influence where you may pick on this? Because we can get an X and O's all you want, but if, if one guy has got, is a Zen master, then, then maybe all bets are off. It's a good question. Um, I'm leaning Rams because I think they're better up front on both sides of the ball. But I like 
the Bengals getting the points, which just goes to show you, I think it's going to be a really close competitive game, which is awesome. It's what we should all want, right? A close competitive game. And I think that's what we're going to get. The Bengals are getting four points. I'll take the Bengals, man, getting those four points all day long. Because I think it's, I think the Rams win, but it could go either way. Give me the four points. Every NFL playoff game is ends on a field goal. You're going to give me more than a field goal? They all end by a three points. Yeah, it's been amazing. What a run the last two weekends. Ross Tucker, CBS Sports, the Ross Tucker Podcast. And don't forget, my front PageStory.com, guaranteed a victory for you on Valentine's Day. Ross, thanks for your time. This is Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Three Nations Brewing Company has 16 different beers on draft with a new beer every Friday. It also offers two air-conditioned tap rooms, a large indoor beer hall, a second-floor mezzanine offering a great overview of the brewing company and equipment and patio where you can relax under the shade. Plus, you can now experience the new Three Nations Beer Garden Grill on our shaded patio with socially distanced seating for your enjoyment. Grab a cold beer and enjoy a bite from our freshly prepared and delicious menu. Street tacos, quesadillas, freshly cooked burgers, and dogs and veggie burgers too. State Fair tornado fries, nachos, and so much more all prepared and cooked on site. So come visit the award-winning Three Nations Brewing Company on East Vandergrift off I-35 in Carrollton. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby is a homegrown, family-owned and operated must-visit pizza place in Waco. Fantastic pizza by the slice or get the whole pie to share. Great happy hour specials every single day. And it's not just pizza. Great wings. You have to try the Sikkim sauce, chili cheese fries, pizza pillows, and more. Dine in for a great hangout or carryout. Order online at shortyspizzashack.com or do yourself a favor and bring your crew to the restaurant at 12th and Bagby. Shorty's Pizza Shack. Tell them Paul sent you by. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. It was broad daylight. I stepped into a gas station for five minutes to grab a snack, and just like that, my car was broken into. They made out like a bandit. My laptop, my phone, everything. I called my agent to see what could be done, and he restored my faith in humanity. My claim was processed so quickly, and I was able to recover my losses. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Payments for qualified buyers only at 2.9% with 5,000 down cash or trade. TTL Extra. See dealer for details. It's New Year, new ride time at Richard Carr. New Year pre-owned deals like a 2017 Dodge Challenger for $272 a month, a 2019 Ford F-150 for $422 a month, or a 2014 Cadillac CTS sedan for $227 a month. Our vehicles go through a 172-point inspection, and we pay top dollar for your trade. 100% approval is always our goal. Find your next car or truck at Richard Carr. At Richard Carr, we give you more. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive at North 19th Street in Waco is a hidden gem. They've got a great selection of spirits, wine, and the most extensive selection of craft beer in Waco in their gorgeous walk-in fridge. And they have an amazing array of high-end bourbons like Pinhook, Weller, Buffalo Trace, Brush Creek, Hotel, Garrison Brothers, Thomas S. Moore, Hooten Young, and Bardstown. Great customer service and a convenient and speedy drive through window. Riverbend Liquor and Wine. Find out more on Facebook and Instagram. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. This is Paul Catalina's Top 5 at 555. Presented by Champion Salon and Barber. To book your appointment, go to championsalonandbarber.com. All right, top five things the Bengals making the Super Bowl made me think. So it kind of came to me in about a 30-second run after the game yesterday. Well, hey, man, hats off to the NFL for the last two weekends. Oh, yeah. God, I mean, yeah. they could not have scripted, scheduled, wished for any better last two playoff rounds than, than what they've got. I mean, 
if somehow they could just bottle that magic. But, uh, yeah, pretty incredible uh, the, how good these playoffs have been. Yeah. All right, number five. We are in the upside down. The Bengals have an owner who, again, is kind of outside of it. And, you know, for a long time, he had Marvin Lewis, who was just doing the same thing, treading water for the longest time. Didn't do anything about it. And and here they are. He hires a young guy, changes things up, and they're in the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It did like the Bengals were not trying the way that other teams are trying, and then all of a sudden they hit on Joe Burrow, they hit on Jamar Chase, and then it. Well, you keep saying that. I think that's unfair. I they they just were in a funk, like oh, a thirty yeah. year funk, like a thirty year funk. It didn't mean they weren't trying. I mean they were. Look, Marvin, Lewis, they come in, and Mike Brown and Marvin Lewis had this organizational philosophy of. Uh, well, if they've been cut from the Cowboys for their behavior, which is bad, oh, no. we'll get them. Back in the day? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, they, you know, they So that yeah. was what they were doing. It doesn't make any sense uh, what they were doing, but they're there now. Yeah, Marvin Lewis lost five wild card playoff games in a row at one point, and then the last five years they weren't even sniffing the playoffs, mm -hmm. and then yet here they are. And, yeah, you know, they beat Tennessee, and that was kind of improbable because Tennessee was a you know a top team. And then turn around, win again, you're just like – Huh, uh, and and I I mean I don't know, man. Like I I was actually rooting for the Bengals. Like I guess if I was rooting in any way, I, I wanted to see the Bengals just for something a little bit new. And uh, I still didn't think that they were going to be able to beat the Chiefs, you know. And I'm not ready to think that they're going to beat the Rams. But if they did, would anybody be shocked no. by it at this point? Absolutely not. I have and no if, idea. Yeah. And if they did, nobody's going to be shocked by it because is there anyone swaggier than Joey B? No. I mean, he's a, he's a cold-blooded killer. I mean, uh, and, you know, the cigar after the LSU National Championship, he was like, it was a picture of Jamar Chase and Joey, Joe Burrow's father, who played at Nebraska, both out in the parking lot lighting one up. Yeah. Oh, boy, did Nebraska fans talk about that mm -hmm. very much, that connection. Of yeah. like, I, here's the other thing. Joe, Joe Burrow yesterday, somebody mm -hmm. asked him about Ohio State, and he's like, I don't know why. He's like you. You. It's where you. Not where you start. It's where you finish. It's yeah. like I'm an LSU Tiger. I don't know why Ohio State people try to claim me. He didn't play there. No. Yeah. No. I. I don't think Ohio State folks should should claim him. Um, no. Yeah. He didn't play there. I mean. Yeah. He was on the roster technically. He don't need to be on the graphic for Ohio State Buckeye. He didn't finish his career there, so I, I don't count that. Even if he did start his career there, it's like if Quinn Ewers goes and wins big, is he going to get credit for being at Ohio State too? No. Yeah. Absolutely not. He shouldn't. So. But yeah. I mean. I mean, it helps. The, the swaggy part helps because he's a white dude, you know, because there's plenty of swagged out uh, super athletes in the in the NFL. But, I mean, there, there's just something about him, you know, with the uh, just the, the way he carries himself and the way his teammates seem to love him and the way he just – there's just something – like there's just this <clears throat> invisible little thing that he has it. that's special, that it factor, yep. yeah, and – uh, it's pretty amazing to watch. It really is because we all know it. We all know it while we're watching it, and yet he just he keeps doing his thing. He, he, there's a story, and and uh, it, it's Bruce Feldman who wrote a story about Joe Burrow and some of the time the timeline. It's not like a long length. It's just certain things he did when he was younger at LSU, including telling Devin White to shut the blank up at a <laughs> practice one time, and he just kind of has that. You know, some guys have it. You don't raise your hand and say I'm a leader. You just kind of. You kind of know who, who they are when, they, when they're on, a, on your team. All right, number three, the path out of the cellar is two to three draft picks away. Honestly, I mean, there are five wins last year, even with Joe Burrow, and he did get hurt, hurt at the end of the year. Uh, but Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase completely mm. changed. The, and, and look, for T. Higgins was a first-round draft pick before. Man, and he so, made some top yeah, yeah, catches. Look, too. They've got uh, – look, <laughs> They've got some quad, I'll call it quadruplets, uh, because you've got Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and wide receiver Joe Mixon, who has really, really had a fantastic season at running back, and Joe Burrow at quarterback. Yep, you're you're doing pretty well, and that, that's that's something you can build around. You get them some functional offensive linemen. Yep. I'm yep. not talking five Larry Allens here, but if you get the, and you know, you don't need Anthony Munoz all across the line again. If you get some better offensive line, that offense is going to really explode. Yeah, and you know what? The defense yesterday made plays. They they got after Mahomes. He was running for his life, sometimes running himself out of place. They played well enough. I, they did. Yeah. I, I was surprised by that. But yeah, that offensive line, they can work and tweak on that now in the offseason. 
Yeah, and they're going to have to, <laughs> just for Joe Burrow's yeah. sake, they're going to have to do that. But uh, what did y'all think of uh, Mahomes' decision, the pass no, to Tyree Kill right before the It made the no half? sense at all. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't see, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that every quarterback doesn't have a brain fart, whatever, but that's not something you would ever expect. Well, he was trying to get way too much, kick the field goal, and or throw the damn thing away or in the back of the end zone. Ross Tucker just talked yeah, about it on the interview yeah. where he said, "Look, that you know, there's he was right there on the sideline when it happened, and you throw the ball in the end zone, or you throw it out of the end zone. That's it. That's the only two things mm -hmm. you do to throw it in the flat. I know Tyree Kill is fast, but that's too greedy. That's what they wanted you, you got to greedy. do. Greedy, yeah, they got, you got greedy, greedy. And, and they got greedy. At, yeah, they got greedy. Yeah. That's what and they did. That felt too like a major turning oh, point no, when they got no that question. stop. It was like, oh wait that's, a second, and that's what he says. And yeah. Zach Taylor was fired up. He was ready to go. All right, number two, if Mike Brown can get his team back in the Super Bowl, Jerry Jones is out of excuses. That's it. The Bengals are in. The Cowboys have no more excuses. Well, yeah, I know. Again, there's a list. There are the Browns, and there are the Lions, and then the next one's up are the Washington football team, name whoever. The Texans. And the Texans, yeah, because they, but as far as length the, of time. They haven't been, like the Texans and the Jaguars have never been, but they're – They've, they've not been around that 96 long. 96 or 95, yeah. That, it's the same timeline. Washington and Dallas are right there, right below the Browns and the Lions on the length of time I, of Super Bowl. I don't even think Jerry's making excuses anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think I think he's I think he's been out, and I think, you know, maybe the, the fans have excuses they can throw up there. Like, well, you know, some might say, well, Dak's not good enough, or the O-line's not good enough, or whatever's not good enough. Look, that that was not a good O-line that Cincinnati was playing with, and there yet they still found they found a way to win. So found a way to win. Yeah, and so yeah, I don't know, I don't know what that missing piece is for the Cowboys. I really don't. They've tried literally everything at this point, but um, I mean they're at least still on the doorstep. But uh, yeah, the fact the Bengals could just bust through like that when Dallas has been so close so many times is frustrating. As frustrated as Jerry was watching the games a week ago. Imagine him watching Cincinnati punch a ticket to the Super Bowl. Yeah. All right, one more. All right, and number one. Man, the Lions really are the worst organization in the NFL. <laughs> like, they and the, the Bengals have been on parallel tracks for the longest time until Joe Burrow. You and know, the Lions played for a championship in 91. Yeah, but, like, I it's mean, just... the NFC. But it's just... They're just so bad. And, they yeah. like, every decision they make blows up in their face. Yeah, I saw a re I saw somebody basically say that, and then Jamel Hill. Uh, I does she is she from Detroit? Is she from? Uh, I think she's from Michigan, uh, if not from Detroit. But she like took it a certain kind of way, which I thought was odd, and tried to paint it completely different. And all the guy was really saying was like, "Yeah, they're just the worst organization." And I forget what that that conversation turned into, um, but I don't know. She was, I guess, trying to make it out like. They try and, and what, but like, spare me. Like, let's not, let's not make excuses for the Lions. They are a forgettable organization. I have nothing against them in any way, but they were only really relevant because Stafford was still on the team. And just because he was on the team, that's all you would really think about. And, and then, yeah, he, he leaves and, um, they're just there. I mean, really, yeah. they're just th kind of there. This wasn't even just Stafford being on the Rams kind of thing. It was just that those two organizations, Cincinnati and Detroit, were essentially on parallel tracks for the longest time. They were they were right there, both of them making bad decisions. I mean, the Bengals, obviously, a little bit better than the Lions over that time, but not really. You know, Matthew Stafford's played in three wild card rounds over his career in Detroit, so not too far off of what Marvin Lewis and Mike Brown were doing in Cincinnati, but, man, they just, like... At every turn, the Lions just—if they were on "Let's Make a Deal," it would just they would—they would always like, all right, behind one door is all the money you'll ever need, and behind the second door is a chainsaw uh, maniac. And they're like, ah, door number two, ah, yeah, chainsaw maniac. A, a franchise that had Barry Sanders. Now some running backs play for bad teams, but Barry Sanders, and they were in the '91 State uh, NFC Championship game with Eric Kramer. They'd beaten Dallas, I think, in the wild card round. But when Dallas had Laufenberg or who would no, it wouldn't have been. La Burline maybe was playing quarterback. Aikman was hurt. And that was it for them. And they've just not sniffed. Yeah, no. the Lions are one of those teams that got three straight top ten picks. And, you know, those guys might, you know, Jeffrey Akuda might be good or whatever. But, like, it's, you know, as far as making them count, they – they just get better players, yeah. but they don't become a better team, really. Yeah, and yeah it's a, they're just they're just an organization that's just kind of been there for a while now, and not really anything to to really point out or, or touch on much. It's just they're there. They're one of thirty two, and and they're normally number thirty one or thirty two. It it seems like. 
Uh, but yeah, that had to be somewhat painful. I'm sure Lions fans were happy for Stafford, but yeah. at the same time, a little bit like, yeah. oh, come on now. When we come back tomorrow at three o'clock, Carlos Silva writes for Texas or covers Texas Tech in Lubbock on their game with Texas. That's tomorrow. Also, we'll hear from Evan Miyakawa, nearly Dr. Miyakawa, on stats and all that kind of stuff, trending analytics with the men's basketball. Tonight, Beta West Virginia at 8. We'll discuss that as well. And for Emery, Jack Armstrong, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke, our amazing sponsors, and also, of course, you who watch or listen to us every day on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. I'm David Smoke. Good night. is a small family business right here in Central Texas. We're open to support you while lowering the cost of health care bills. When you need an MRI, ask your doctor for an Ideal MRI. Visit us at IdealMRI.com or call us at 833-IDEAL-MRI. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. After my first car accident, I feared the biggest damage would be to my wallet. I expected a mountain of bills and a long, drawn-out process. But my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent was there when I needed her and helped me get back on my feet and in my car in no time. Instead of a hassle, I got reassurance and a quick recovery. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation.